lot of people are very poor there were they call us a lot of sugar cane is grown particularly in the terai habitat in uh, up what they call us a sugar cane tigers nowadays you know unfortunately because of that uh, cow protection policy of the uh, uh, policy of the government lot of useless cattle are come dumped into this area even from far from areas you know people bring the cattle simply throw them there and go away but whenever a cattle is killed somebody come and say that is my cattle and claim compensation from the forest department so the cattle problem is a huge problem in our country for tiger conservation this nobody is talking about it, but one should be aware of this actually next so in north east india isolated tiger protected areas north east india is very productive poverty is there poaching thing is there insurgency flood or the problems here number of tiger reserve nearly 2000 square kilometers i have spent some time there and uh, there are uh, practically there are maybe one or two tigers only not many tigers and easily it can support some 50 tigers because there is prey has been totally poached out by the people local people there actually okay and uh, baksa damba tiger reserve these are also you know they are very almost empty recently in damba tiger reserve one tiger pagmark was seen kasiringa tiger is the i mean uh, what we call as a serengeti of india is the soul of north east india good number of tigers are there and manas tiger also tiger reserve also has some tigers in the dibang up in the mountains you know they have some tigers and uh, sundarbans you know including um, our uh, bangladesh no area may be some 10000 square kilometer area extremely low prey density chitl and oil pig so very very low so the maximum 100 tigers will be there in that landscape you know they say they know some of our tigers found in central india or in western ghats the males can reach a weight of 250 kg but sundarban tigers the males are very very small because they survey one very little amount of prey i mean chitral and wild pig i was lucky to spend uh, some two days two full days in sundarbans going by boat i mean uh, counting animals and i saw four five chitral four five wild pig that is all next So Central India, we have some fabulous areas like Kanha Tiger Reserve, Panna Tiger Reserve, and so on. But you know, the problem is more like a broken family. The tiger habitats are far apart; they are not together, and there are threats in the corridors that are fragile, and they are not uh, present in many places. They are threatened by roads, rail tracks, canals, and mining. And uh, Indravati tiger reserve looks very large, but no one knows the status of tiger there, actually. So here, what we can do tomorrow, you know, if the, if we want to maintain the genetic viability of the population, we may have to translocate tigers from one area to another area, because that uh, is going to be exceedingly difficult to manage the tiger corridors in this landscape. Next, Western Ghats. the best area for long term conservation of tiger even elephant and gaur and so on in the nilgiri landscape i call it as nilgiri landscapes where we have the brahmagiri vayanad nagarkolai bandipur mudumalai upper nilgiri satyamangalam they are all together like a joint family some 8000 square kilometer area definitely there could be some 500 tigers here and in the in the, if you go south you know we have that animal landscape is I mean, uh, maybe some 5,000 square kilometer area. We can have some 100 tigers, and the Periyar landscape can have another 100 tigers. That again, you know, they are broken. Actually, they are not connected. I mean, there is a fragile connectivity between Periyar landscape and the Kalakad Mundandre landscape in the southern end. But the Nilgiri landscape, you know, and it, you know, it is a promising place for long-term conservation. But there, the huge problem is, you know, abundance of weeds. unpalatable plants which make the habitat very poor for the uh, tigers angulates next say in our country you know that we take long time to implement some conservation program this is a corridor and one said you know you see that uh, uh, ganges flowing in the middle uh, with this i mean south of the ganges we have the chilla mutichur you can see that below 
chilla chilla range north we have the mortichur or ranipur range and so on and this corridor is a simplest corridor what i call chilla mortichur corridor i wrote about it 30 years ago still we not have formed that corridor actually i mean um, if we are able to form this corridor you know we will have a continuous habitat of nearly uh, 6000 square kilometer tiger elephant landscape including the famous carbet and rajaji landscape in the landscape has a potential to support some 500 tigers but what i am saying 30 years we have taken i used to tell you know if it is chinese you know they have done it in 6 months but we have taken 30 30 30 years to still still in you know, on the corridor is not functional next next corridor is the corridor of the ganges river and the ganges what are the problems in our protected area one major problem is habitat degradation by the abundance of inedible plants both native and exotic near absence of regeneration of edible plants is a huge problem actually because animals need plants which can be eaten by them then only can have a high density of ungulates actually and then uh, for example as i said the nilgiri landscape we have lantana camera opunisha delineae parthenum hysinoperus chenna spectabilis this came recently when i when i was doing my wild dog study it is it was not there it just got fabulous flowers golden flowers that's the reason called as spectabilis some officer thought it is a good looking plant you know it was planted now it has taken over all the moist areas in the lower nilgiri section like kana you know it is such a great model in uh, weed eradication you know every year the meadow habitats you know the people walk and uproot they have good tribal population nearby which they are able to employ and uproot uh, which is not done in many places actually we simply allow the weeds to multiply we have officers like shankar i mean sanjay shukla nick murakkar is a grassland expert now see for example in the southern border of carbet you know the laldan grasslands i know this place that years ago it was a huge patch of lanjana but you know that lanjana patch was removed and they have planted this vetiveria grass the credit for this goes to rajiv bartri the place is of udranjal actually what i am saying if there are dedicated officers you know they do lot of good things for the reserve and i was telling about the ex- good example of our srinivas murthy who is here so rajiv bartri was very dedicated he, but this model you know they unfortunately they are not replicated in other areas so landana area is taken over by now i mean uh, vetiveria grass it's not a great uh, palatable grass but better than uh, i mean uh, landana last time when i went with the diploma class here we saw tiger with two cups going into this patch so if there is a dedication good planning and so on and is possible to control landana by planting uh, alternate species what happens in many places they simply remove the landana but nothing is done landana comes back so that should not be the came something should be replanted in that area that's very very crucial next so i was telling about a huge problem of lack of regeneration of palatable species for example it's a very valuable species the gruvia tilifolia the bark and all you can see all bark the bark has been debarked by elephants fortunately this tree does not die actually and the leaves are eaten by all the ungulates one day so i had dead i mean what you call dry leaf falling from the canopy it was taken and eaten by barking deer barking deer they are supposed to eat very lush i mean tender uh, uh, food but it was eating the dry leaf of gruvia tilifolia many many such valuable species like melina arborea terminale bellerica you know they suffer from lack of regeneration you know this problem has not been addressed by our forest department or by our government otherwise after 100 years what we will have we will have all these big trees would have died out we will end up having only lantana it's a very difficult problem to address but one should worry about it actually it's so a kumar pushkar he is and uh, karigalan two forest officers there in the picture next say so cool season burning is very vital in grassland management So after burn, you know, then there will be nutritious grass which will be available to the wild ungulates in early summer. Remember, fire is a good servant; it's a bad master. We should control the fire, and the fire is an integral part of many dry deciduous, moist deciduous forest habitats. Total, some people, you know, say that no, 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 fire should be totally protected from forest. They are wrong. You may protect for two, three years, 
four years after that you know then when there is a fire and you know the the damage caused to the area will be enormous actually the cool season burning in all possible places should be done it is very very important you know so that it can control the devastating annual summer fires and it can promote uh, good growth of palatable plants also next see this is one thing i took this picture in rajaji west of ganges actually the people used to come for babur grass cutting poor people very poor people after cutting for a day you know the enormous hard work they will be able to sell it only for some 40 rupees but when they are climbing the hills and they do that in winter and when they see a jungle grove i mean flying into a valley they will drop uh, grass cutting go and look for the kills i myself have seen them taking away five samber kills one of our assistant yasin was living in that uh, dolkand in rajaji he has seen them taking away 40 kills during a period of 10 years so imagine what will happen to a, a tigress pregnant tigress if a tiger kills are stolen in winter 3 4 months if she has three young cubs what will happen to the cubs so that was a major decline of i mean tiger population west of ganges and rajaji when i joined the institute in 19 uh, Uh, 85 and so on and there were at least some 20 30 tigers west of ganges now there are only two left now they have reintroduced some three four tigers from uh, karbat in this landscape okay so what i am saying kill stealing by the poor people can also affect the tiger population and uh, now i understand you know this problem has been uh, controlled because people now just go a lot for plastic you know they no longer come and cut uh, uh, grass uh, from Rajaji Park, and this cutting is done only in the Shivalik area, not in the Greater Himalaya, not in the Outer Himalaya area. Only the Shivaliks they do that, and west of Ganges we have the best Shivalik habitat. Next, why do tigers become manators? And Carbet in very rightly writes, you know, on a fresh kill, wounded tiger, tigers, small cubs will occasionally kill small uh, human beings. but these tigers cannot be called as manators if killing continues by the same tiger called as a manator for example uttaranchal they used to say if there is three killings and three kills are eaten by tiger you should declare it as a manator such manators should be eliminated and the poor people will rise against the conservation we should not try to capture them much because very very difficult actually remember carbot root when a tiger becomes a manator it loses all fear of human beings unlike leopard you know you know they can operate in daytime also so he found easier to kill the manating tigers he found difficult to kill the manating leopards which were operating at night and you know in those days he did not have powerful torches also okay so when a tiger operates in an area actually it creates enormous fear some years you know in the nilgiris you know there was a dodda bata manator for 20 days there was no work done nobody went to the field nobody went to the tea garden schools were closed what you call curfew imposed by the manator okay next sundarbans you know we have the problem of manating but you know mr bist you know ss bist a fine officer and you know, who has worked there he says seldom people are killed outside sundarbans mangrove habitat inside the mangrove habitat a lot of killing happens because people when they go for uh, collecting honey you know inside the man- mangrove habitat you know i mean they crawl and go and in, in a tiger habitat if you crawl and go you know you are likely to be killed by tiger so that is the reason you know inside the mangrove habitat people killed and the over the centuries tiger found in you know, as much easier to kill and they become manators so even when a group of people in sundarbans in the mangrove habitat they go inside talking and uh, you know chatting you know the tigers know that oh, okay there some prey is coming they will come and kill a human being so all killing most of the killing happens within the mangrove habitat outside and you know, people they walk erect inside the mangrove habitat they crawl and go when they walk erect you know tigers are afraid of them you know and they don't make any frontal attack so killing outside is very very rare most of the killing happens inside the sundarbans and that was a wonderful observation made by ss bist who retired as a, a chief of labor warden of uh, uh, west bengal next 
So tigers, when they go for killing, they go for the skull. They crush the skull like an eggshell, actually. And leopards, you know, they go for throat bite. Okay. This picture was taken by Peter Jackson, who was the chairman of the cat specialist group. It's no more. Like this uh, school teacher was killed in Nepal by a tiger. Next. See how many tigers India can have. So we made a calculation with Madhusudan and her daughter Vivash Panda, who is the director of BNHS now. And uh, in Nepal and Bhutan, Bangladesh, Tukutar, we think uh, India at the most, India means Indian subcontinent at the most can have 3,700 tigers. That is our understanding. Okay. If there are, the potential habitat is there, you can have more tigers. If there are more tigers, I tell you, the forest department will be in trouble because there will be a lot of conflict with the poor people and which will affect the forest department, particularly the lower staff who we work in that area, actually. Okay. So, I, in my opinion, we should be happy with the number of tigers we have now. We should manage them with the less conflict with the people. That is my understanding. Next. Sambar conservation in the hilly area is tiger conservation because sambar and tiger, you know, they are uh, ecologically, behaviorally, and biologically the most suitable prey of tiger. But the conservation of tiger is difficult as it needs quality habitat. For example, when I did my wild dog study in Bandipur, Madhumali, those areas, there are a lot of sambar. Most of the so very few samber we have now. The Pambra, samber population has declined. Like Panna, for example, is at a very good area for samber. I can see some, some of my best samber in Panna because that uh, forage availability there in the form of Zizibus, Mauritian, and so on is excellent there. Very interestingly, the langurs, you know, they play a very important role in central India, northern India. I mean, feeding the Angolese in summer. Okay, next. See, human disturbance and tiger conservation cannot go together. For example, Chilla, I mean, it's part of Rajaji Tiger Reserve now. And uh, there were the Gujas were living, tigers were there, they were not breeding. If, for example, the picture of this hilltop tigress. Once the Gujas were removed, the Gujas, you know, they are Muslim people, they don't poach. Very eat very little meat also, actually. But they were causing a lot of disturbance in living there. They had occupied the prime habitat along the river valleys. So because of the disturbance, the tigers were not breeding. So once the Gujas left, you know, the tigers started breeding. Now we have the Chilla range, we have very good population of tigers there. Okay, next. I mean, uh, see, I have been happy. <laughs> I, told, I took a picture of a tiger from that mango tree in 19... Um, when I mean, it was doing wild dog study in Bandipur, 78. After that, after I retired and then came and did a survey of the Western Guards, then along the Moya River between Bandipur and the Satyamangalam Tiger Reserve, I took this picture. Okay, I had the alarm call. I stood there behind a tree, but I made a mistake of telling another friend, you know, gave a signal the tiger is coming, but the poor fellow, he came and sat in the open area. Otherwise, the tiger would have come very close to me and I would have got some very good pictures, actually. Next. See, no other country one can have photographs like this. Like I took a picture long time ago in Randambu Tiger Reserve on that side of Padamthal. You know, tigers are watching human beings. They are in the open gypsy. <laughs> if they want, they can pull out a human being from the gypsy very easily. But they don't do that. They are habituated to people. Next. I mean, this is like, uh, this. you know, our people give names like Arrowhead Tigers and so on. See, this tiger is it had full belly. It was going towards his cub. There are two cubs near the Jogi Magal. So the Sambar were standing and giving alarm call. I told you Sambar is the most suitable prey for the tiger. But even then, her belly was full. So unnecessarily, they don't kill. It can't kill also. With the full belly, it won't be able to stalk and kill the prey. And it was going to the cubs. Okay? And uh, Sambar standing there and uh, raising the tail and giving alarm call. Next. Say, in India, you know, we have tiger population, a lot of tigers die. For example, the New Indian Express, uh, 30th July 21, between 2012 and 2019, 
As many as 750 tigers have died in the country. More tigers have died in Madhya Pradesh because there are a lot of tigers. Maharashtra, there is a lot of conflict in Karnataka and in Uttaranchal. This is bound to happen. I mean, uh, after all, tigers are, uh, they are not immortal. They are mortal like human beings. You know, they have to die. I mean, they die, you know. A male tiger at the most will be able to hold on to the territory, territory for five years. Then it will be pushed away. Okay. And a female can be there for 10, 15 years actually breeding. Next. Reasons for the death. For example, in Kurg, you know, near uh, Nagargole, there are a lot of snaring for wild pigs. So this uh, tiger was caught in the snare and died. And Manoji Kumar, you know, from the Karnataka Forest Department was kind enough to give me this picture. Snaring can kill. Next. They get killed on the railway track, on the road. This picture was given by Ravikran Govarkar, a fine officer. Uh, working in Punch Tiger Reserve as a field director now. Next. 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 Okay. See, in 2005, we were returning from Sariska Tiger Reserve with the MSC students. Then we were told, you know, this uh, Delhi people and told that we have we have a huge bundle of tiger bones weighing nearly 300 kg. At least there were 20 tigers. You know, I mean, that the bones were there. They were about to be smuggled to Nepal and China. So poaching for traditional Chinese medicine is a huge threat, particularly in North India. Because when you kill there, you know, it's much easier to smuggle. I mean, that way South Indian tiger population is fairly safe. If, you know, poachers, they cannot come and operate in South India as freely as they operate in North India. Okay. How many here we can see? The, at least six skulls we can see. Next. What are the benefits of saving tiger? I know it's a beautiful, uh, like in the book called Riding the Tiger, Tiger Conservation in the Human Dominant Landscape. complex ecosystem and habitat, march of human need and all of greed has got nearly 60 tigers. They will hesitate to, I mean, destroy it. Although they are planning a, I mean, uh, linking of river and so on, there is a lot of opposition to that actually. If there are no tigers, you now they would have gone for this linking project, the river linking project immediately. Now there is a lot of protest. Okay. So tigers you now make that habitat, a forest area, very, very valuable. So if Habitat without tigers, you know, they are not, uh, they do, don't have that much value. Next. Two very famous tiger experts, you know, what Jim Carbett says, we often quote it, tiger is a large hearted gentleman with boundless courage. And that when he is exterminated, as exterminated, he will be unless public opinion rallies to his support. India will be poorer by having lost the finest of her fauna. See, I got interested in wildlife by reading Tamil translator Jim, Jim Corbett book. So I will address, uh, ask all the students to get Jim Corbett books. There are two volumes that uh, Naraj, you know, they sell it in Daradun. You get them some 800 rupees. I read through them. You can learn a lot about uh, wildlife by reading that book. And it's a great writing. And uh, anybody interested in wildlife, should, like Bible, you know, they should have these two books actually. Okay. And John Seedon Sikar, he was my guru in the Smithsonian when I went to America. He says it's difficult to visualize India without tigers. It will be like imagining an inky black sky without stars. Okay. So, I mean, definitely tigers will be there in India. And with India without tigers and elephants, you know, will be a very, very barren, empty country, actually. Next. Okay. I mean, this is one thing. I just I was asked to discuss about it, what are the job opportunities for biology students. I think uh, it's very, very teaching in a school and college. That is one job. Definitely, you can think about it, actually. Okay. Uh, um, wildlife research. But I will say only brilliant students should think about it, not the mediocre students. Because nowadays, it becomes very tough. If you are very good in English, mathematics, and, you know, physically fit, 
good english and so on you know then you can think about wildlife research others in i tell you you cannot survive and this joining wildlife research as nature guides there are a lot of research in our country they need good nature guides for that you know i mean there are opportunities and joining the state forest service as range forest officers and as assistant conservator for us there are exams you know which you can write and uh, you know and uh, become range officer or acf joining indian forest service i mean uh, ifs like our murthy is here as an example so that also you can think about but all these remember you need a very good uh, i mean uh, knowledge proficiency in english and uh, you should have a good fitness and uh, maintain good, good health and i will recommend all of you to play vigorous games like basketball football hockey i mean uh, don't play only cricket cricket does not give you enough excess this i tell you everywhere actually you play cricket but play other games also which will give you i mean lot of uh, fitness which is very very important you know if you want to be, i mean lead a good life and uh, think about a good service in the forest department and so on so any discussion we can have these are the points i wanted to share with you and thanks for this opportunity yeah thank you sir so uh, we have one question in the chat box mm -hmm. by stephen fernandes Uh, how uh, tribal communities in india can help to make tiger conservation more effective i didn't understand what did you say so how tribal communities in india hmm. can help to make tiger conservation more effective see that the tribal should be taken care very well we have very good examples in south india for example like in um, முதுமலை ஆனமலை பரம்பி பரம்பிக்குளம் பெரியார் முண்டந்திரை கிளக்காட்டு முண்டந்திரை ஆல் தீஸ் பிளேசஸ் இந்த ட்ரைபல்ஸ் ஆர் இன்வால்வ் இன் த ஃபாரஸ்ட் டிபார்ட்மெண்ட் கான்சர்வேஷன் ஒர்க் ஓகே தே சர்வ் இன் த ஃபாரஸ்ட் டிபார்ட்மெண்ட் தேர் எம்ப்ளாய்டு அண்ட் தேர் நீட்ஸ் ஆர் டேக்கன் கேர் ஆஃப் இட் ஐ மீன் தட் இஸ் வெரி வெரி இம்பார்ட்டன்ட் யூ கான் யூ ஷுட் நாட் ஆன்டகனைஸ் ட்ரைபல்ஸ் இஃப் யூ ஆன்டகனைஸ் ட்ரைபல்ஸ் நோ தே கேன் ஒர்க் அகேன்ஸ்ட் கான்சர்வேஷன் so i mean tribal should be considered as part of the conservation program that's very very important i think they have enormous see when i did my wild dog study i had one tribal assistant by name kichana amazing fellow the kurba community now unfortunately in bandipur all the tribals have been settled outside so if we go to bandipur i will not find somebody like kichana to help me with that work actually they lost a great talent which the tribals have actually that should not happen in my opinion so tribals should be part of the conservation program in the country okay yeah participants any more questions so there is one more uh, question by pragnyan being a territorial animal okay see the thing is you, know, you can't uh, translate a tiger to another area where there are tigers see what happened in uh, pench you know they were growing this uh, tigress avani's uh, daughter the ravikiran goverkar was you know caring for it nearly 3 years and they released in the same area there was another tigress so they fought and this uh, young tiger was killed so that i mean if you want to translate a tiger you should take it in area where there are uh, no tigers good amount of prey only in such places can be reintroduction can be done long time ago in sundarbans one male was caught and released in the heart of sundarbans it got killed by another tiger so territorial animal true and uh, you cannot release them in an area where there are other tigers then definitely there will be a fight usually the local tiger will win so you have to take in an area where there are empty habitats with lot of prey so can i can i add some more some more this to particular question please 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 sir muthi yeah uh, so mr prandian i would like to elaborate two more points with for which uh, dr johnson has added one thing tigers naturally travel 
without traveling of the tigers because they are long ranging animals the blood mixture cannot happen so whenever a tiger reaches a new area again there is a fight there they, it will happen and it's part of the natural process that's one issue and second issue will be where you lose the tigers unfortunately then you have to bring in those tigers to back to that area so these are the two issues just i wanted to pin uh, point out thank you so one more question by uh, nk shendi uh, can we smart tag each tigers to help conservation what is it what is the question can we smart tag each tigers to help conservation again i didn't understand the question what's the question? Sir, so in the uh, chat box. Ah, yeah, Shendia, please. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Means it is like some something like a SIM card like thing, which we can track its movement and uh, every other activity. No, yeah, they do the radio coloring. They do that, and they know. But uh, when you radio color animal, in the life becomes very tough for the researcher or the forest staff. because uh, i mean they keep moving and in the radio tracking in the forest area is not that easy actually to get that information uh, people say that you know if the crop breeding elephants are there you radio color them you'll be able to i mean help the people in addressing the problem of crop breeding and this is all theoretically fine but to do that in the field situation exceedingly difficult but a radio telemetry is a very valuable tool to know about the home range dispersal and uh, what prey it kills uh, all such information be uh, gathered by using telemetry actually so there is one more question uh, will there be any adverse effect of introducing lion and cheetah in india will there be any conflict between tiger and lions if overlaps of territory how wise is to introduce the cheetah and lion in area where they have already extinct say in those days if we go through this literature you know tigers and lions have lived in uh, certain areas together so tigers usually they occupy dense habitat valley habitats and the lions in you know, on that open area particularly in the central indian india there were many instances where people were beating the forest for tiger a lion came and they shot it so they have occurred to go there but definitely there will be conflict in the conflict in a definitely tiger will have an upper hand actually okay so this now that plan to introduce cheetah in india i mean um, in panna tiger so i mean there are a lot of questions asked about it because the area is very small maybe 750 square kilometer area and part of the area is hilly also the hilly area you know that cheetah cannot uh, do very well actually so when you see the habitats in africa the habitat is flat area vast area lot of prey so where the cheetah even their cheetah have problem to survive but in panna if you bring the uh, cheetah you know the problem will be you know they may go out and start feeding on uh, goat and sheep and uh, there are a lot of dogs also around in our country two three dogs can they can attack and kill cheetah cheetah is a very timid animal very 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 uh, not a courageous animal like a leopard even the person you know, when they see a group of dogs they go up the trees and cheetah cannot climb the tree so a lot of uh, but they are planning to bring cheetah to panna let us see what happens but uh, you know there was a very good so not panna the kuno and um, there were plans to bring lions to kuno but unfortunately gujarat government was not willing that was a good program to bring lions to kuno uh, but li lions and tiger i mean um, they have occurred in the past if the habitat is suitable you know both can live but there will be conflict uh, sir dr varad giri has raised hand i think so want to convey something uh, thank you thank you ma'am am i audible yeah yeah yes sir yes sir because so, indeed a great pleasure listening to you after long gap and uh, so i have i have a small observation sir and correct me if i'm wrong uh, day by day we are leaving away the natural history part of the biodiversity mm. studies no i see very few people i i know the amount of field work you did and your understanding is strongly based on all those things mm. but day by day we are losing that 
sir uh, uh, am i right or wrong because i feel that people are sitting in the lab and talking about conservation rather than going to the forest and studying them i fully agree with you it's very unfortunate actually say first of all even jars shaler used to say you know if you want to become a good uh, wildlife scientist you should become a good naturalist yes if you are a naturalist you know you should be able to know the flora like you know all that the herpetofauna in under the rocks <laughs> that will be difficult for everybody to do that but you know basically you should be a fairly good naturalist you should be able to should spend a lot of time in the forest walking interacting with the tribals and so on see i learned two years you know for example or six months before that in the nearby saigur forest that was a remarkable period in my life actually because i came to study without any training nobody there to teach me actually you know i learned all myself with the help of the tribal i was telling about my assistant called kichana okay so i mean that knowledge is amazing you know i have spent a lot of time sitting up in the trees or hiding and watching animals i mean that type of work is not done by many students nowadays actually as you rightly said i did all my work on foot but in the, nowadays you know they have vehicle and so on more facilities and uh, but uh, should not be the case i mean a lot of natural history talent is very very important that is much more rewarding also yeah <laughs> i i personally feel that no they have the answer and then they go out to seek the explanation No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. So one last question, sir, uh, by Pradhyan Sio Patil. How do we groom our children to serve in Indian Forest Department and work in this field? What kind of primary pre- preparation should we get done from children? Like our Varad Gri said, you know, make them interested in nature first of all. If they are strong in the nature and uh, you know around their home you know what are the trees are there what are the birds come there what are butterflies are there you know let them start with that actually then reading lot of things related to that they should enrich their knowledge they should be physically fit they play let them play all the good games and uh, good food and become very strong healthy and uh, a healthy body healthy mind and good knowledge you know will be very very important for them to think about a career in the forest department thank you very much sir for a informative session uh, may i request uh, suiza quadros to introduce the uh, next resource person good morning everyone the second session for today is going to be delivered by dr varad giri on the topic recent advances in herpetology and career opportunities dr varad giri is a renowned scientist with more than 20 years of experience in scientific explorations biodiversity inventory and conservation currently he is serving at bombay natural history society mumbai as a senior project coordinator He is a scientific associate in Natural History Museum in London, associate scientist in Global Wildlife Conservation, and a senior scientist of Indian Herpetological Society, Pune. Dr. Giri has described four new genera and fifty-eight new species of amphibians and reptiles from India, one species of a snake, and two species of geckos are named after him. recently a new genus of semi slug that is a snail variety varadia has been named after him in honor of his contribution to the indian herpetology dr giri has published 62 scientific publications in peer reviewed scientific journals of national and international repute he has also worked as a curator in the natural history collections of bombay natural history society and national center for biological sciences bangalore he has to his credit more than 50 popular articles in various natural history magazines and newspapers 
He is an editor of two citizen science driven dedicated websites on amphibians and reptiles of India. With this brief introduction, I would now request Dr. Giri to kindly begin with his session. Thank you for a wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, Is my presentation visible to everyone? Yes, yes, sir. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, now it's now. Thank you. Uh, at the onset, I'd like to thank uh, MP College for this uh, wonderful opportunity to share the dais with uh, uh, one of the icons in the field of Indian <laughs> empire. Uh, <laughs> uh, Sir, John Singh, sir, who just gave this presentation, and uh, for me, he's like a he's like an iconic figure because we used to look at the way he used to work. I never worked on mammals or anything, but but I've seen him uh, and his contributions, and I learned quite a lot of stories about the way he worked. And uh, the researchers who worked with him, and when we used to interact, they used to say that no, you need to be very strong. Mentally, physically, you know, to work with <laughs> John Singh, sir. And then I realized that my mental and physical abilities are not so strong. So let's not work on ties. Let's work on something else. So I started looking at amphibians and reptiles. But, you know, uh, sharing a dais with him is, is, is uh, you know, uh, a dream come true for me. Uh, for that, again, I, I'm thankful to college. Okay. So uh, I was asked to talk about uh, Indian herpetology and... Uh, Descent, whatever it may be. So I'm just trying to make it a bit, uh, going to discuss this in a different perspective. So uh, when we talk about opportunities, you know, uh, in the field of biodiversity, the opportunities are in the form of research and conservation. So let's look at it and let's see, are there any opportunities uh, in terms of Indian herpetology? So this is something to do with, uh, uh, this talk is all about my uh, feeling or my uh, understanding about this field and uh, this is what I feel that oh, there are so many opportunities. So this is my personal uh, uh, experience I'm sharing here with you. So let's start with the first basic thing, no? uh, uh, conservation. So when we talk about conservation, what are the basic ingredients of conservation? That is something which we need to understand first because our uh, uh, talk is all about opportunities, research and conservation. So let's see what is conservation. No? is the first and foremost thing what we need for conservation is the species name or how many species are there, the comp species composition basically. So this is something really, really very crucial. Without the name, I don't feel that we can start conservation. And this name is derived from a science called the taxonomy and nowadays uh, a phylogeny is the integral part of taxonomy. So these are like very, very important aspects uh, when it comes to naming a species. And why it is important, I, I'm going to discuss that uh, as well. So, species name is something really very crucial because conservation starts that. And the science which deals with that is taxonomy. And uh, today, a fundamental science which is required for conservation is critically endangered. Tell me how many people are seriously doing taxonomy on lesser, lesser known life forms? No, their number is highly negligible and uh, probably that is going to hamper our conservation uh, process in future as well because our understanding about biodiversity is quite poor in that, in that regard. So I think you know, uh, taxonomy is a very crucial factor in conservation. If the name is wrong, everything goes wrong. Next is information about the natural history and distribution. We need to know what do they eat, where do they live. You know that you know, in, in Hindi we say that roti, kapta or makan are the three integral uh, uh, ingredients for the conservation of uh, humans. Similarly, animals need food and place to stay. So the understanding of uh, food and uh, their habitat is highly crucial for the conservation. 
no and uh, the distribution again so everything is really very important and uh, this is something another important aspect of conservation and for which we need to have the information that is threads so so these are the three important uh, ingredients of conservation so let's see how does that matter no uh, let's look at the first example taxonomy and how does that matter now so this is a snake called melanophidium kerry uh, which we described from uh, northern extremities of the western ghats means from goa north karnataka and maharashtra prior to that this snake has a name and the name was melanophidium punctatum okay so interestingly there is a species called melanophidium punctatum but the species is in the southern western ghats south of the palghat gap when we talk about all this you know uh, diversity and everything so this gaps and everything they are like very important very crucial ha huh? a species which was south of the palghat gap was been reported from the northern extremities of its distribution and we believed in that and if that is true then the distribution of this species becomes widely distributed it is there everywhere means one wrong information or one wrong identification was bad for two different species so this is how the conservation the taxonomy helps us in planning the measurable conservation initiatives okay so the description of a species from northern extremities as a different species highlighted the importance now the population which is in the south southern part of the western ghats is different and the one in the north is different. so they are now point endemics or they have a restricted range now means they become conserved so this is how conservation uh, taxonomy helps us in you uh, know uh, uh, conservation and let's think of the opportunities in that regard i'm going to talk about that as well so the second component is uh, naturalist and distribution okay so this is a toad called amboli toad okay and this toad has a very interesting and unique breeding behavior now why we need to know all these factors why ecology is important no i was discussing with uh, uh, john singh sir about why people are not going out and understanding the natural history because that natural history information is crucial and vital for designing the measurable conservation initiatives and if we don't have that information how are we come uh, going to come up with uh, a strong conservation uh, plan no so this toad breeds on a small on these uh, big or small uh, medium sized lateritic rocks little bit water which accumulates there so that is their breeding pond and they breed only in that you know so imagine so that habitat and that behavior is so crucial and the understanding of this more than 80 morphological characters but they are difficult to distinguish we can't say that this is a different species oh, cryptic cryptic means they look exactly the same you know and there Philodendron is coming for a rescue. So this cryptic diversity, this is one example, and there are multiple examples like this uh, in India where you know, we really don't know anything. Taxonomy is the problem. After taxonomy, we have to go for other uh, aspects. Well. So understanding for understanding this cryptic diversity, we have to do intensive sampling. No. So this is a, a very interesting example of uh, widely distributed or not. So this is a species called Hemidactus brooki in India. So in 2016, a lady called Aparna Lazmi, Dr. Aparna Lazmi, uh, who was doing her PhD on house geckos. Imagine a girl catching a lizard. Like if you are a girl, the first thing which comes to your brain after looking at a house lizard is broomstick. But Aparna said no. I will I will catch them and study them. And she became one of the first lady in India to study uh, these lizards. And one of the potential findings of our study was there is no hemidactyl brooki in india prior to this every where this species was known and his study proved her study proved that uh, uh, hemidactyl brooki is confined to borneo and what we call hemidactyl brooki in india has at least eight different species which are endemic which are only known from india means we were doing injustice to all those species so see for conservation this understanding of uh, biodiversity uh, everything is really really very important and uh, studies like this uh, highlight that 
what will be the what should be our direction in future so we shouldn't be believing in what is there we have to ask questions go ask question try to answer it and probably will come up with some amazing results like this no and there is unknown diversity as well no this is a study published by r chaitanya r chaitanya was a was a it professional uh, till 2014 imagine a it professional 2014 Uh, is responsible for the discovery of these new species, six new species of uh, Dravidian gecko. This genus is endemic to India, con uh, confined to the Western Ghats, southern and middle part of the Western Ghats. And uh, he studied them, he looked at them, and he and there was only one species known. So Chaitanya thought that you no, know, it should not be one because they are patchily distributed. There there are different barriers in the Western Ghats. So when he started looking at them, he realized that all are distinct species. Now I'm talking about one of the highly explored landscape called Western Ghats, from where these six new species were described in 2009, 19, before two years. No, so there is still there are so many uh, you know, unknown, undescribed species in India, and we need to you know, uh, put in our efforts to to describe those. So description is one part. that's what i'm trying to uh, highlight here because nowadays everybody is behind describing a new species so what is happening to them is also equally important and for that we need to start our uh, you no know, uh, studies by looking at their behaviors okay now this is a very interesting study about uh, a fanthroded lizard okay and this lizard has a fan the males have a very extended fan on their throat and they use it for display to attract the females okay and that behavior is quite quite amazing so the, then people started they uh, uh, in until in 2016 uh, deepak uh, et al described uh, around five new species of uh, fan throated lizards from india prior to that only one species was known so these people this this particular discovery has highlighted that india has a uh, 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 quite a good diversity of uh, panthered lizards and they are known from arid landscapes so this highlighted this also highlighted the importance of importance of arid landscapes as well okay now after this discovery uh, there is a uh, amazing scientist from pune his name is amod samre he started looking at their behavior no why they have this blue black orange color throat and he got some you know amazing uh, 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 responses for his study so this is the only lizard i know for which uh, a behavioral study has been done there are many species for which we don't know anything now look at this this is something very interesting you know if you look at the species description trend in india you know from 2000 onwards you can see that thing going up how much high it will go i don't know but at one point of time it, it will reach you know and uh, similar is true for uh, sicilians and frogs as well so that's why for me that 2000 is a very very uh, important time where this all started and we are still into that new species description mode how many people are looking at uh, you know uh, okay now this is something which i would like to highlight again is uh, unexplored landscape no so, uh, ishan agarwal has started looking at arid landscapes and from where he described many new species so dry landscapes from where and uh, his study now proved that the lizards in india are common in drier parts than in the western ghats the number of lizard is higher in the arid landscapes than in the western ghats no so this is something again uh, again uh, 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 because the hotspot for lizards is not the western ghats but it is something else no so we need these kind of studies to have a uh, uh, quite lot of understanding no and people are taking a step ahead as i told you they are not only describing new species but ishan's this study also talks about you no know, uh, how the biogeography of himalaya has shaped the diversity of one uh, group of lizards called cetrodactylus no so this is something which is cool so see this is what is the transformation which is happening in india but these studies are quite a in few numbers we need many more studies no so look at this another study by ishan agarwal 
where he talked about uh, how this you know uh, uh, expansion of plants determined the diverse of uh, lizards again you know? so this is something these these studies are really good cool. so indian herpes can give you amazing opportunities to ask these kind of questions the people who ask questions they got answers and there are many many lizards frog snakes turtles and tortoises sicilians for which we don't have this understanding if you ask me what are the opportunities imagine like there are thousands and thousands of opportunities waiting for you to come and ask question and start exploring uh, and i see that transformation happening the scientists are i'm not i'm not criticizing everyone but like we are more into you know uh, statistics we are more into uh, mathematics we are more into modeling and all those kind of things and slowly we are losing the naturalistic part of it tell me how many people sit and watch what these frogs do what these lizards do nothing that is not happening okay so that's where we need uh, more attention unfortunately you know out of thousand species in india the information about ecology or natural history is available for hardly 5% uh, species 95% for 95% species we really don't know anything now you tell me how many opportunities are there for you no so this is one best example like that amul ham studied their behavior and he published some terrific papers these are endemic lizards in india and they are doing such a acts which is are going to help us to to understand biodiversity again this is another lab uh, a maria tucker's lab where they are looking at you know uh, colors in lizards and how does that help so very few studies are happening but we need many more studies like this so for you there are opportunities in taxonomy there are opportunities in biogeography you ask me i will give you the <laughs> option so like every bear there are opportunities waiting for you and at the end you feel that you no know, how can i contribute i don't have a scientific background i will say that start doing the awareness why there are few people studying amphibians and reptiles in india what i realized is many people don't like this subject because they don't understand what is the importance of these groups they feel that are oh, these are not good look and they don't look at them but the moment you realize the value i think the things change so you no know, we started these small programs training programs we conduct uh, you know i personally uh, is involved i'm personally involved in that and i conduct these training programs so what is it no it's like i i am really proud that you know who are many people who are studying amphibians and reptiles in india i am marginally responsible No, to inculcate that interest or help them in you know, taking some step ahead. I'm not taking that credit, but these small efforts has you no know, brought big change. There are many people studying amphibians and reptiles in India, but we still need more of it, more people because there is there are many unexplored landscapes and there are many many species for which we really don't know. Anything. No, so for if you look at career opportunity, there are plenty. Look at you no. Know, you or you ask me there are there are reasons for that so just to you know, bring your attention to this look at this chart no so only talking about lizards here no and uh, out of whatever that number is first take the sample out of 64 species species for which we have some understanding Look at gecko nidae, 138 species, or more than that, and we don't have any, we don't know anything about a single species until now. Then how are we going to do the conservation of these species? We talk about endemicity, we talk about uh, uh, richness, but we really don't know anything about that. No. Okay. So I would like to leave this uh, particular discussion with a thought process. I don't want to give the answer, but I just want to raise some questions here. Are we doing justice for Indian herpeta fauna? Is my question. We have just described it, but is that a justice? 
are we really doing the justice for indian arbitra fauna you think about it and then uh, uh, let know what is needed is something really very important so if you want to know the career options the moment you start answering these questions you will get the path you will find the answers for your questions here itself no and then who will bring this change <laughs> we know that there is a change needed but who will bring this change and you are the people who can bring this change okay interestingly this is the golden era for the uh, studies on indian ambiguous and defense i told I, i i mentioned that in my talk that it started with just description but today there are so many things happening like people are doing few people are doing behavioral studies and those are of international quality few people are doing ph phylogeny biogeography you know uh, uh, new species descriptions but that number is few but all the so many things are happening the we, the moment we add more people to this probably you know we can come up with some uh, good result again i would like to request everyone here is uh, we should be thinking beyond the box okay nowadays there is a big rush for describing a new species every one is describing new species see species description i i i did that but i don't feel proud about it because i know that there are many species for which the habitat is going and gone what is the fun of describing them if i am not doing anything to them just describing is not a not a great idea we have to go a step ahead and try to do some contribution to our conservation as well no so we have to have a, this dedicated and integrated approach so we have to have collaboration start working with people and i started this citizen science initiative uh, long ago in 2014 ar chaitanya joined that uh, one of the courses and today uh, he is much better than me <laughs> he is one of the best arbitrologist in india if you ask me who is the best phylogenetic uh, phylogenetic person in india is it come to ambigens and reptiles i will undoubtedly say that that uh, chaitanya is the best person biogeography ishan agarwal is best person and all these people are ready to support you are ready to teach you so this is more fun again so they are not trying to confine them, themselves they are they are ready to help you support you everything we need people you know and uh, dedicated ecological okay. studies are needed and uh, for which again we need everything so uh, so this is where we have the opportunities so before i uh, uh, finish my presentation i would like to thank dempe college again for this good opportunity uh, Rupti Madam, thank you. <laughs> you invited me things like that. Thank you all. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Varad Giri. Yeah. Can I ask a question, Varad? Sir, please, sir, please. You know, how will you study the food habits of, uh, say, common frog, rana, without killing it? No, sir, not a single study. No, no. no. I'm. Yeah. How will you suppose you want to study yeah. the food habits of? Uh, I don't know whether rana hexadiatella, the name has been changed. So, 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 so there are sir, there is something called stomach flushing. You, okay. you can you can catch the frog and no you know, uh, you the things and uh, you know by doing we can study their fooding food habit other things sir what we did is direct observation which is really very difficult you no know, to uh, correlate for uh, uh, amphibians and reptiles but uh, for cecilians we did one thing like uh, we try to uh, this frogs also they uh, when they shit their their thing we try to use it for you no know, identifying their food content and that is one way we can do direct observations is but something that is very do. tough yeah to uh, yeah but sir, sir, see i what i personally feel is we we have zero information today okay and we okay. have to start adding this you no know? mm. 
trying to get as much data as possible. Like mm-hmm. for for example, now Indian bullfrog is known to feed on multiple things, no? And people have photographed those things, but it has not been documented. So if that can be put on, uh, uh, I think, sir, we have to start building it up. Without killing is something really very important. I also encourage people to visit the museums and try to look at the museum specimens if they allow you to open and study the field things. That is also one thing, one way you can understand it. And stomach flushing is one more technique. No? But I your information on the hemidactylus bruchi is amazing, huh? Hemidactylus bruchi. <laughs> it is not there in India. And we, we used to say that it is there throughout India. Yeah, now yeah. It is it is composed of 10 different species, sir. And if, you all see, are... if you see all the zoology books, you will get a picture of uh, Emidactylus Brookie. Yes, sir. No, that's the most common uh, house lizard, the you know, most common yeah. example, you know. It's a, it's, it was considered as one of the commonest house, house lizard, which is not there in India. Yeah. <laughs> it was wrongly named. That yeah, is also a very, very important point you said, you know, about uh, that snake, you know, that uh, which was found in, uh, named, discovered and found in uh, Southern Western Ghats. Yes, sir. And wrongly identified in North and uh, people started telling it has get a very wide distribution in the Western Ghats. Yes. You know, so one correct identification gives a clue, you know, about the their uh, and sir, so there'll be done for conservation of the species. Very, very crucial, actually. Yeah. Sir, un- unfortunately, we described certain species and after that, we never went ahead to understand their habits, habitats, because for conservation, all these things are needed. Distributions are for, interestingly, we don't have a proper distribution map for more than 85 to 90% of reptiles and amphibians in India. Everything is points. And today, with all this advent of uh, taxonomy, people are describing new species. And uh, we don't know what is the distribution now. How many so, you, how many you? Conservation practitioner, like forest department officials, I have to tell them that this is what is there in your, in, in your uh, forest. But are we confident in doing that? No. We are just describing and forgetting. And the description should be sir, so uh, uh, professional that anybody can or should use that information. That's where, again, is the failure. That's what I personally feel. Now, you can say a few lines about the contribution of the Britishers in the habit of understanding. I mean, uh, what do you think about their identification in those days? Are they still valid nowadays? 100% species descriptions they did are still valid. The best example is one of British India, written by Malcolm Smith. Mm. I don't feel that any Indian herpetologist mm. now has read his book mm. because the amount of information he gathered mm. and presented mm. is phenomenal because mm. he, has, he has studied the specimens, he, he discussed about skeletons, he discussed about muscles, everything. But mm. sir, today, taxonomy has become like a, a cut paste business. So get the data, everything is finalized, you just get some information, get some knowledge, just put it there and go ahead. So he had the like he talked about a particular character, like suppose this feet looks like this, and he gave the reason why it is like that. So, so all the taxonomy characters he correlated with their behavior mm. and ecology. So we are not doing that now. We are just you no, know, we are getting away from that strong taxonomic foundation. Mm. That way, the contribution of the British is amazing. Those amazing, sir, sir, if they, they would not have documented this today, we would have been in mess. Agree, agree. Thank you. Yes, Very nice. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can I, can I uh, interact with uh, Dr. Varad? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Dr. Varad, hi. I hope, I hope you can hear me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, doctor. I think I, think I, I just uh, came online uh, just to thank you for uh, a reason. Uh, you remember you came to university. I mean, I invited you for, uh, I mean, for a talk. There you mentioned one point which I want to mention on this platform, and you are an inspiration to the entire uh, nation and and globally you are known figure actually, and uh, you mentioned one point uh, during your lecture, you never know you might find some new species in Goa University campus, yeah. 
and it came through and 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 with the help of uh, of course akshay and ishan they have named that species after goa and that is uh, uh, you know i hope you are aware about it and it has already come in zoo taxa and uh, already getting published next month so i i just want to thank you for that uh, inspiration and of course my association with you for last two and a half decade uh, and uh, certainly in in goa university with your help we have also floated a herpetology full length paper nowhere this herpetology co i mean paper is being floated as you you it's your inspiration i i want to say this on this open platform because you have been a very very uh, kind to support me for all my work throughout uh, my tenure i i uh, i obliged to you and uh, really acknowledge uh, your work and your contribution to our nation uh, as a whole thank you very much dr varad and nice hearing you uh, on this platform thank nice you very doctor. much thanks doctor nice to thank you all this and and for the kind information i think dr johnson sir raised on uh, one question one of my student right now working on this aspect of what you are talking about the food habits of frogs so we have selected four uh, frogs and uh, on uh, flushing uh, technique we are going to work on the dietary pattern of these particular frogs so soon probably uh, we may come out, out with some uh, good uh, publication out of that thank you very much uh, dr varad for that all your inspiration and support for me thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you dr nitin savan sir there is one question from ms vaishnavi nai she is asking what are your views on some extinct reptiles which is getting discovered again see uh, uh, interestingly i will forget about those extinct reptiles the best example from india this is a snake called indian agita okay so it was thought to be extinct it was described that after that nobody seen that and suddenly somebody managed to catch one snake and that was identified as indian agita and now it is everywhere so this extinction or rarity see when it comes to amphibians and reptiles in a country like india you know i don't believe in the words like rare or extinct because there are many species which are described and after that nobody went and looked at them see if somebody like dedicatedly search for something and if they don't find it then we can call that as extinct or rare no interestingly i will tell you one more thing there is a group of amphibians called sicilians okay. until 2003 no i i i was i was not interested in that group then in 2003 i realized let's work on that group because there was less competition and that told me i am not an intelligent guy i want to i, I always look at the possibilities so sicilian was one group where less herpetologists were working in india at that time so i decided to work there and there also i decided to work in the northern part of the western ghats the moment i discussed this with my ex friends they started laughing they said are idhar to kuch milta nahi hai to kya karega kuch nahi milega so i started looking for sicilians in this landscape with a open mind i said that i don't know their habits i don't know their habitats i will just go and search everywhere okay see our science is also dedicated by uh, uh, thinking so we know that a particular species is found in a particular habitat we go and search there and then we say that oh it is there but i say let's forget about everything let's go look for sicilians and everybody told me that sicilians are very rare very very rare they are like good and today i will tell you that everything was wrong <laughs> that is one of the commonest amphibian in under one rock of 2 by 2 feet we got 21 individuals no see why they were there there was a less efforts sicilian is a borrowing they rarely come on the ground to see them we took the rocks turn the leaf litter do the digging and then and then only we see them people earlier they never did it and they said oh, they are rare no so that rarity extinction is all uh, that is true only when we put in efforts dedicated efforts to document them and unfortunately for india we really don't know how many species are extinct now or how many species are really present so this extinction is something quite uh, interesting and see probably they, they were there but they were overlooked now we are saying that they have been 
they have been reported. I, I shared the example of India negative. Uh, Dr. Varad, yeah, I kindly request you to add more info on uh, the Citizen Science Initiative. There are many students who like to know about it. Thanks, uh, uh, So, Citizen Science is a is a small initiative we started uh, because see, when I joined BNHS in 1999, and then I started understanding uh, amphibians and reptiles. And unfortunately, uh, very few people were there to teach me. And fortunately, there were people like Daisy Daniel. He was that person was was amazing because he popularized Indian amphibians and reptiles. And he was one of my first mentors. Then I met Ashok Captain. Ashok Captain is a scientist, but his contribution on snake taxonomy is phenomenal. Because the, he is the one who brought snake taxonomy to common people. Always went to scientists. So I met the right people at the right point of time in my life. And then I realized that you know, if these people teach me, I have to teach this to other people as well. So whatever I understood, I started you know, interacting with people and teaching them. See, the idea was for teaching, we need to read a lot. So I have to have, do my work also. So we started interacting with people who don't have scientific background and trying to and encourage them to take this field seriously. So, and uh, whenever they observe certain things, uh, they used to document stuff like that. And in doing so, Quite a few people got trained. And these people are today, they have described new species as well. The so best example is Archaya. He described 20 new species. Okay. He tried to register for PhD in India. Nobody took him. Today he is doing his PhD in Tel Aviv University with Shai Meri. Shai Meri is one of the prominent herpetologists in the world. And he took him for doing PhD. He is doing his PhD on track of this flying list. So this is a prominent example of citizen science. And for citizen science, what we need to do is, see, we click photograph and we upload that on the Facebook. Similar amount of time is needed to upload that on iNaturalist. Okay, the moment you upload a photograph on iNaturalist, your photograph becomes a data point. You know what is photograph? Photograph is, is, a, is, a, is a, you have freezed the evolution there is a historical moment which assures that a particular species is present in, a, in, in that area on that date. If you've got some behavior that indicates that a particular species behaves like this. So this is an amazing naturalist data. Suppose if you have photographed something that tells that this is the time when they breed. You have all these images lying on your hard disk for no use. But the moment you upload these images on this uh, sites like iNaturalist becomes a data point, and that data point helps in the distribution, helps in the understanding of naturalist everything about that particular species. So I request everyone here to upload your images, and the moment you do that, your photograph becomes a data point, means it becomes a research document, and you become a researcher. Means you are a citizen scientist. You are a scientist now because you are contributing to science. Okay, and there do we need to identify things? No, don't worry. There are people who identify stuff. There, there are experts who look at it. You just have to upload your image there. That's all, and that's how you are directly contributing to science. And I request everyone here to become citizen science scientists like this. And see, when Chaitanya write a paper, you don't ask for his degree. Look at the content, and he is publishing good papers in good scientific journals. If Stetner do why not everybody can become a scientist like this? This is what is my idea of citizen science. So and, uh, sorry, sorry, I forgot the, one thing. So yeah, one of the prominent citizen scientists in India, according to me, is Dr. Salim Ali. <laughs> they, there are so many people doing his, their PhD or his, the work he has done. So look at this. So, uh, a dedicatedly interested naturalist. 
and his contributions are so amazing, so phenomenal. So he is the best example for citizen scientists. Salim Ali Saab ka jo kaam hai, wo hamko inspiration usi ki wajah se deta hai. Ashok Kapoor is another citizen scientist. There are many people like this who are the real citizen scientists who don't have any technical zoology degree or anything, but their work itself is more than many PhD thesis. Yeah, thanks. You know, I will say one thing about Dr. Salim Ali. His observations were largely natural history. Yes, sir. No. Yes, sir. His observation on the drangos in Peria, yeah. on that white belly drango or that uh, common drango, that uh, racketed drango, when our Indian's uh, wife, yes. when she did her PhD in uh, Peria, she had so many sightings, 2,000, 3,000 sightings of this drango, that drango, and different habitat types. Yes, yes, Eventually, when she looked at the data, she was confirming what Salimani has recorded. Uh, yes. As a naturalist, you know. Yes. So, you know, you are so meticulous with these observations, you know. I think that is one thing, you know, like uh, with pen and paper, you know, and they used to write beautiful handwriting, good uh, notes. That is one thing, you know. I mean, uh, people should uh, always go with a notebook when you go to the forest. Whatever you see, please record. If you think, if you remember them, you are wrong. Remember, the ink is much more powerful than the your memory. That one is always remember. If you think, then I'll remember everything, I'll write it tomorrow. We'll, we'll, you will miss so many points. So the ink is much more powerful than the memory. That all the students should be aware of that actually. Yeah. So those 11 volumes of uh, Ali and Ripley, mm. they're like, they're like Bible play. You know, I, sometimes I feel that the he is like that after reading these books. You no, know, it is so... It's so perfectly observed and written. Yeah, I do agree with this. You know, this uh, white crested laughing threats in the Himalaya, he says it's more like a Sardar with the white turban. <laughs> you know, I mean, his English was amazing and a very fantastic person. Yeah. Mm. I was very lucky to, when Hussein was alive, you know, one day we took him from uh, Peria to Kalakad. And we were going the jeep, and he was sitting in that front seat. We, me and Hussein were sitting in the back seat. He was like a bird, <laughs> eating, 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 you know. He will ask Hussein, give me some cashew. Hussein, give me that uh, orange. Give me that apple. Keep on eating. Such a small man. I mean, he had a great appetite, and he was eating the best food, actually. That was the reason for his health. Yeah. So there is a uh, one last question for you. Uh, do earthworms form a part of herpetology? And nowadays their number is coming down. So would you like to throw some light on it? The question is asked by Pradnyan. So Mike is on mute. Earthworms, uh, earthworms are inverted threats. No, they are annelids, annelida, it's a different group, okay, and uh, herpetology is composed of amphibians and reptiles, and they are vertebrates, so Arthum is entirely a different group, and uh, uh, herpetology is entirely a different group, no, uh, we don't know, um, I don't know much about Arthums, and uh, I'm sure, like, if he is worried about uh, their population is declining, tell me one species whose population is increasing in India today. Except humans. I think everybody, every species population is declining and uh, this is really a cause of concern today. See, one huge conservation problem in our country is the use of pesticides. Yes. Enormous amount of pesticides, you know, we simply use in all the landscapes. If you go to Kasiranga, I don't see big hives. No. Because, you know, the amount of pesticides they use in the tea gardens is so enormous. Amazing trees are Thing. I have gone to Kasiranga many times. I'm I'm yet to see one. You no, know, I think we kill, we are killing yes, ourselves. Yes, we are this is what I would like ourselves. to say that no, we say that we are declining. The biodiversity is declining. Again, it will come back. But the humans are going to go, and we can't survive without them. We need them. They don't need us. And if you ask me, how can I confidently say that? Look at what is happening for the last three years. One species which is confined to the house is Homo sapiens, humans. 
the wider city was being done. Pollution was under control. Everything was happening cool. So what does that indicate? That indicates that humans are not needed in the wider city. No? And nature is uh, taking steps to throw us out. If you, if you stay, if you, if you really want to survive, we have to be like a crow, we have to be like a honeybee, crouch, then and then we will survive. Otherwise, our survival is at stake now. So that, you know, pesticides should have affected these air tones very badly. Because they are, yeah. as you said, you know, Anil is very soft skin. Yeah. And uh, in those days, you know, I remember when it was a, when there was a good rain, you can see a lot of air tones coming to this, uh, above the soil, you know, swimming around. We used to catch them and go for fishing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, unfortunately, Guinea must have got extinct now. We don't know. Without Which our one? knowledge. Without our knowledge. Which one? Air tones. Uh -huh. Many species must have gone extinct. There are quite yeah, a lot. Yeah. I have seen huge, huge atoms like no. in, in the Western Ghats. Yeah. No, you, don't, you rarely see them. So, mm. I remember that. Yes, Any wonderful talk and nice listening to you, Varad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Same. Same. I, I, I enjoyed it. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Varad Giri for taking time out of his busy schedule and enlightening us about the recent advances in herpetology and career opportunities. I now request Dr. Teresa to introduce the next speaker for the day. Thank you, Suizal. Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Vish Lakshmi. Uh, welcome, ma'am. Dr. Shubhalakshmi is an award-winning entomologist, educationist, and entrepreneur. After working in the environment sector for more than two decades, she founded three entities, such as Ladybird Environmental Consulting, Nature Watch Foundation, Bird Wing Publishers. Ma'am developed environmental mobile apps and online courses, which are the first of their kind. Through her company, she carries our rejuvenation and reforestation works to improve biodiversity. She works in the sphere of environmental CSR and environmental protection. She authored India's first field guide to Indian moths. She is a member of the IUCN Group on Conservation Education and National Moth Week. A leadership case study was written on her by Webson College, United States. She is a winner of Green Teacher Award of Kiloskar Vasundara. Dr. Shubhalakshmi is the founder of I Nature Watch Foundation and Managing Trustee. Ma'am will be presenting on the topic, How to Study Moths. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Dr. Teresa, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, Dr. John Singh, it's nice to hear you after um, many as it, ages, I would say. I don't remember when I heard you last in BNHS. Um, it was nice to hear to word also. So um, I'm, I'm really uh, thank you, thank you, excited. Thank you, thank you. I'm really excited to be it's part of this group because uh, Tripti has been writing to me that uh, uh, so many people have registered and from so many uh, institutes and even from some foreign countries. So thank you so much for organizing this and I'll be really happy to share my uh, passion which is moths with the students over here. And though the um, uh, topic of this uh, seminar is of scope in wildlife biology, uh, as far as entomology is concerned, the scope is not really great, unfortunately because I don't want to build any false hopes that uh, you have built a very fantastic career. Uh, if you look at my profile, my profile has very little to do with entomology. My profile is more about environment uh, because I uh, spend a substantial time in BNHS study, being, studying the environment education. So that has been my forte and that is what actually is um, helping with me with my bread and butter, if I have to say that. But entomology has been my passion. I never gave up on that. Whether um, there is um, any um, 
financial um, returns or not. It is something passion. So I think the one advice I would like to give to the younger generation: don't pursue money as your first priority. You know, because I believe everyone keeps telling you that this is a career you have to pursue because there is lots of money. Because the problem is that after five to ten years, you are in that job which is which is giving you very um, high salary. It is still feeling very, you know, hollow inside because there is nothing that fills you inside. So what is what is that that fills you from inside and keeps you content as long as you are alive? I think that's your passion. So find out what is your passion and fill that passion into you. Then you can keep doing jobs only for money's sake and but pursuing um, your passion. You never know where you will get a chance to uh, grow. So I did that exactly. I followed my uh, passion. My passion has been uh, environment, but uh, I would say a specialization of my passion is entomology because that's where uh, um, you know my uh, like the thing that fills me up is entomology. So I keep doing the work which is meant for uh, to run my company to pay salaries, but I do things that actually fills up my soul, and that is moths. And uh, the only financial again i would say which i would have got after studying moths for last 25 years is that i published a book and uh, from the sale of the book you can say that would be the uh, receipt but but it's a it's a if i can still study moths because it's endless subject so today i'm going to talk about moths uh, as a subject of uh, students who are interested in research um and many a time uh like of course uh, like i heard what are talking about citizen science we you people today in a golden era of doing research i'll tell you why one today research citizen science is also research based the time when i was doing my research it was only that you have to go and find information then only you can publish paper then only you can write about it but today you can sit in one location and citizen scientists who are working across the country or across the world their data also you can use and Use and augment it with your study. So there is so like one can fast track the studies in current time. And secondly, technology, the the amount of tools which are present today is is so it makes easy easy to do research, easy to even to connect with specialists. I I it was a when I still remember the entire my uh, masters and PhD years. It was so difficult to connect with a with an expert. Uh, and share information or learn from an expert because we didn't have the technology that time only email was existing email also came later on of course so we didn't have that today you can connect with uh, experts world over and people are so i think thanks to the pandemic what it has done really it has broken the barriers completely earlier also emails were there facebook was there social media everything was there but people were not so openly coming forward and meeting you and interacting with you today you can send a whatsapp message to someone or you can send a messenger message to someone and you get immediate response so things have really changed and that's really, that's the reason i call it as a golden era of uh, doing research so coming to my topic um, on moths today i'm going to specifically talk about moth life histories this is one topic which anybody can take up and this is one uh, area where there is a scope of discovering lots of new species as well as um, filling the data deficiency as to the life histories are concerned of moths and which means there is enough scope to write to publish papers so uh, from so which your field you might be pursuing if uh, caterpillars rearing is something you you would like i think you can give a give a try to it because a moth seriously need this support the information is really lacking in our country and uh, and until this this field doesn't progress to a level where it becomes really lucrative that even students can make a career full fledged career in it to bring to this to moths to that group we really have to work more so at least another 5 to 10 years more people are required working in the sector then only moths will shine as birds are shining today okay so i would like to share my screen now just in a moment yeah uh, so let me know if uh, and i will put on a slide show mode whether uh, you can see my full screen and whether the slides are progressing because at sometimes i uh, 
faced a situation a problem where the slides were not progressing when i put in slide show mode so can you see my second slide <laughs> Yes, Second slide is visible. No, ma'am. Only the first slide. First slide is okay, visible. Okay, okay, okay. So that is the problem with the. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Guess, yes. Now the second. So slide. Now, now second slide. So I think I'll keep it on a uh, on this mode only. Okay. Uh, I'll just try to reduce the. Is it better? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. So I'm uh, the topic of my. Um, question is uh, how to study moth life history so first uh, a bit about uh, moths and then why uh, to study moth life histories uh, so moths as you all would be knowing they are all cousins of butterflies yet butterflies got all the glamour and the limelight and moths are still where they are they are in dark you know literally in dark uh so the reason i always tell people that why this disparity between the cousins is that um one cousin one cousin chose to lead a day life and one cousin chose to lead the night life so one which is in the day life that is a butterfly it is very much like it, it, the we interact with butterflies very frequently because you come across them very frequently because their timing and our timing of remaining awake is same so you see more of butterflies you see the colors you appreciate them and that's it so butterflies are accepted moths on the other hand they are also colorful they are having same charm as butterflies it's only that they are operating in the night time and we don't come across them and the ones which we come across are the ones which are very tiny brown kind of moths which come to your lights in the night time during the monsoon and we just assume that entire moth community is just like this so it's nothing beautiful So if you go out and look for moths in the night time, they are as much colorful as butterflies are. So today, so, so not that much. I'm going to talk about the difference between moth and a butterfly, but let's focus down to the moth life history. So the diversity of moths is much much higher. Today we have the numbers that how many butterflies are there in a country. Unfortunately, we don't have such numbers for moths. It's because studies are still lacking. Uh, my book, which I wrote, uh, the field guide of um, field guide to Indian moths. You all will be surprised that this book is the first book, very elaborate book, after what Britishers have written. Britishers wrote a series of volumes called Fauna Volumes. So they wrote five volumes on moths, on Indian moths, between 18th and 19th century. The last publication was somewhere in 1940. You can imagine from 1940. two current times there was not a single book actually talking about them from the field identification perspective there were people from there there are books which are written from the taxonomy aspect so there are agriculture pest uh, moths which are in agriculture pest category are been documented but as a field guide for a general public the book was completely lacking so what does it say it doesn't say that um, like uh, It, it it's clearly says that like not that much effort or emphasis was given on moths, and that's the reason the books are not. So birds, mammals, why they sh shown? Because you know they are very glamorous and that's easy to understand. So are the butterflies. So you get to see all these books around you, but you don't get to see the books on the moths for the reason same that not many people have taken up to study moths, and that's what I want to encourage uh, the current generation or the students who are watching me right now is that if insects are insects fascinate to you then please choose moths for your studies now because of the diversity so we are yet to document them uh, there is zsi figure says that somewhere 12000 plus species are found um, in our country and i usually do a guess work of saying that because world over if you try and look at the world population moths are 10 times more than butterflies so if you take the same measure for india So in India, some fourteen hundred butterflies plus are found. So you can have some fourteen to fifteen thousand species of moths in our country. But recently, uh, like last last week, last month, we celebrated what is called as National Moth Week. So in National Moth Week, world over, like all the people who are uh, studying moths or documenting moths, they all came together. And that's where I, in one of the sessions, I heard that they estimated that India could have nearly thirty thousand species of moths. not imagine that kind of diversity we have and yet though there is no information so if i ask someone to go and look for moths it's a very difficult task i'm asking them to do but there's a very simple way of studying moths is that go and find out the moth caterpillars and rear them 
by rearing them one you will come to know what is the host plant the caterpillar is feeding on secondly you will come to know which moth is coming out of which caterpillar that information itself is a tremendous help for science so that's the reason we are focusing on uh, studying the life histories of moths uh, you would be knowing the uh, basic life history of uh, butterflies there is uh, like it is called complete metamorphosis where the baby doesn't look like the parent that's where uh, the metamorphosis comes in play so it is egg then the caterpillar then the pupa and then the adult that's uh, usually butterfly life cycle but in case of moths there is just one addition not an addition of a stage but a uh, Uh, uh an ad uh, adaptation i would say in the pupa stage the pupa is not in open but uh, moths don't pupate in open they always take a take a covering they always need a covering a protective covering for their pupa and that covering is called as cocoon now cocoon is missing in in butterfly so this is the only difference between butterfly's life history and uh, moth life history the cocoon is a is a structure You, we all know about the silk moth silk cocoon so similarly the moths have different kinds of cocoon one can use one can prefer for leaves one can prefer for soil twigs uh, just a leaf litter or silk so this is this are the different materials what moths use so let's understand uh, let's get to the story the life journey of a moth caterpillar from where it starts and how it starts very much similar to butterflies but i'll just keep adding where moths keep diff differing from butterflies because in the audience if people have already studied butterflies they can find they will be able to relate to this so like butterflies um, moths also lay eggs singly many of the butterflies lay eggs singly and also in some clusters but in addition to that moths are laying eggs in columns also you can see this is like in a cluster they can lay eggs or they can lay eggs in a singular they can lay eggs in a column fashion so there are different different ways where the eggs are being laid now there is there is a uh, there is a explanation that why some moths lay eggs single 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 singly or lay in groups there's an explanation for it so the one thing which differs Or there is another differentiation between butterflies and moths is that uh, the um, um, many moths are non feeders they don't feed as an adult because uh, their life spans are short and uh, when they emerge from the cocoons they have to they just lay eggs and they die let's look at this moth the moth which is uh, down here is called mathura moth and she has just emerged uh, uh, emerged from the um like she she is just uh, finished with laying eggs and she is covering her entire egg sac with her body hairs the body hairs have uh, irritating properties uh, so she is just protecting that so this is a non feeding moth and she, eventually she is going to die so moths who who are non feeders in the adult food they are the ones who lay eggs in clusters they are the ones because they don't have time to lay eggs singly and also these moths emerge when they emerge from the pupa they are loaded with eggs they're just waiting for fertilization so after mating with a male moth the eggs get fertilized and they just lay the eggs and the life cycle is over and the ones who lay eggs singly are the moths who are feeders like hawk moths they keep on feeding on nectar and they keep on reproducing eggs so in their body the eggs are developed one by one and that's how they lay eggs so this is the basic panda behind uh, the eggling style of um, uh, moths now when when an egg is laid on a plant it is usually considered to be a host plant but if you find an egg which is is on a rock or a window pane so assume we believe that, so you you can assume that these moths are polyphagous which means that the caterpillars will figure out what they have to eat because they'll be eating various stuff not one particular plant they might be eating many multiple plants therefore the eggs are not laid on the uh, host host plant so when the eggs are laid uh, the incubation period of uh, egg varies from the size of the moth if the moth is smaller it will take just uh, 3 to 4 days if the moth is larger it might take one week uh, one week uh, to um, you know one week to 12 days uh, like like an atlas moth it will take that that long time because atlas moth is a very big moth so the uh, when the caterpillar hatch when the time comes of um, uh, hatching the the egg egg color changes changes 
changes to darker it becomes darker uh, in and one can see that the caterpillar you can see the caterpillar is also uh, inside and the first meal of the baby uh, caterpillar is the egg shell they eat uh, they eat the uh, egg shell as a first meal uh, so here you can see the egg shell and many al almost all caterpillars do that it is almost like a baby nourishment which is required uh, in eating the um, uh, uh, egg shell a caterpillar when it hatches it is it kind it could be very small it could be like uh, half a half like some are like 3 mm or some could be like 4 to 5 mm that small caterpillar but the same caterpillar can actually in its uh, in its life cycle sorry in its growth pattern can grow 100 times like from like from 5 mm it can give become to 5 cm uh, that long so the caterpillar starts putting on weight uh, in a very short time it could be, it can vary from again 15 days to 1 month if it is an atlas moth or tasa silk moth who have really giant caterpillars they may be feeding for over a month or so because those moths are non feeders and they accumulate all energy in the body by eating more and growing big and this is a stage also when the caterpillars are growing they keep on changing the body color changes sometimes the shape also changes a uh, year uh, there is this is an entire life cycle of a uh, moth called as lobster moth it gets a name because the caterpillar looks like a lobster the final stage of the caterpillar looks like a lobster so every caterpillar this is basically for butterflies and moths also every caterpillar passes through five stages of shedding skin that is called molting so five stages are there and with every stage the body size keeps on increasing and um, uh, that's where the color change or the body shape change also happens like here you can see the caterpillar was in this shape this color and this size when when it was a juvenile the later it changed into something like this where it also became a brown then something different and then something different you can see that how the variations happen in some caterpillars it is very the difference are very stark also like um, there is one uh, hawk moth caterpillar uh, so hawk moth caterpillars usually have a horn at the tail end that is how they are identified so there is this one moth uh, it's called marumba hawk moth which has two tails one on the head and one on the tail but this two tails are only present till the three in stars that is a three stages of um, when the third stage of molting after that in the fourth in star you don't see that horn at all the horn is gone so if someone sees that third in star caterpillar and the final in star caterpillar of the marumba marumba hawk moth uh, people may say oh it is a different species no it is the same species it is that it has changed the the horn is gone yeah so this changes happen in caterpillar stages so all these changes needs to be documented i'm going to share at the end of the um, my session i'm going to share uh, the data sheet which one can use of documenting these changes also and what change uh, how the caterpillar changes from first in star to second in star all that needs to be uh, uh, documented so the the host plant is the plant which they feed so it, many a time the host plant uh, can be one or many of the plant so if you are rearing a caterpillar you know of one plant and say you have run out of the leaves so if you have the knowledge of what are the other plants this caterpillar is feeding and if you can provide them those alternate uh, food plants also sometimes that works we have seen that uh, mostly the flip switching of the host plant uh, food plant from at the earlier stages is much easier than making an adult adult means a fully grown caterpillar to switch the you know food choice is just like you know when we grow like at this age you know i'll i'm very fussy on what i eat and what i don't eat but as a child when ch now the children also very fussy but you know when you, when we we were growing so it is very easy that you can introduce different foods to children so it is same logic uh, uh, applies here so host plant plays a very important role so when you are rearing a caterpillar the role of the plant is also very important so knowing the plant which plant identification of the plant is is also necessary and um, that's why we keep saying that you know we learn botany through entomology so and we always because i run our entomology courses also so i always as a marketing pitch i always say that oh you get one course free on another one that you do entomology and you will learn botany as well and insects are the best botanists and they can teach you a good amount of botany without you getting into the uh, subject Uh, so today i can actually identify plants which are eaten by insects 
Uh, other than that, I like other plants. I can't identify, but I can very well identify the plants that are uh, that insect seed pod. Okay, so caterpillars. Caterpillar stage is it. It lasts long, and this is probably the longest time. And this is the most <coughs> vulnerable time also in the caterpillar's uh, life. And to reach for pupation stage, so it is very difficult for someone who has never uh, done caterpillar rearing to know that when the caterpillar is going to pupate. How do you know that the caterpillar is ready for pupation? So there are some hmm, behavioral changes in the caterpillar that one can look for. Is that when the caterpillar is also about to molt, it is preparing for a let's say it is the first instar caterpillar preparing for the second instar. It will stop feeding. It will it will become motionless. You will almost feel that the caterpillar has died. No, but it is taking one day time. Why? Because it is preparing itself to shed that outer skin. So therefore, that time period, that transition time is required. So these gaps are there, but when the time comes for pupation, the caterpillar becomes restless. It starts wandering, and it starts losing body liquids also. And you may get worried. Oh, what has happened? Because I'm telling you all my experience. Because when I was rearing moth caterpillars, I got very worried. What happened to my caterpillar? All the water is coming out. So and the body shrinks. Body shrinks because the caterpillar, whatever size the caterpillar is, like for example, uh, some hawk moth caterpillars are as like almost ten centimeter long. But the pupa is not than ten ten centimeter. Why? Because the body liquids are like it. It releases the body liquid and shrinks its body. The pupa is much half of it maybe. So the it starts doing that. But first of all, it starts changing its color. Even if it is a green color, it will become dirty brown, dirty green. If it is a brown, it will become a very darker brown. So the color change one can see, and that color change is an indication that the moth, the caterpillar, is preparing for. Uh, pupation. Now, this is the time that one needs to uh, prepare what is called a pupation bed for the uh, caterpillar. You may not really know which what medium the caterpillar is going to choose. So, best is to provide them all the options. As I mentioned, that caterpillars take mediums like silk. Silk is like a uh, like a, it's a fiber that it it makes from its own body liquid. So the the salivary glands in the caterpillar mouth parts are actually modified into silk glands, and it it the silk is present in the caterpillar body in a liquid form. And when that liquid comes in contact with the air, it solidifies, just like the spider silk. Spider same mechanism. So that silk is it can secrete it, and it can actually when it is not required, it can consume it also. Uh, you would have seen uh, caterpillars hanging from the trees, and they are just dangling. And later on, you see the caterpillar actually climbing back. It basically eats up its own protein and starts going. So it's 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 a it's a protein. It's an edible thing for them. So so one group of moths uh, use silk. Some use leaf litter, as I mentioned. Any leaf litter fallen on the ground, they'll just take it. Few leaf litter, some sometimes tiny pebbles, some twigs, some dry leaves. Just put a silk around it and just sit inside and pupate. It. Whereas some will go deep inside the ground. When I say deep. It can go as deep as ten centimeter. I am able to say this because I actually had chased one caterpillar was going to pupate underground. Uh, that's really an interesting episode. Uh, I remember. So finding that where the caterpillar is going and how deep it is going, and and then I actually later on dug out the pupa to know that what is the distance it traveled. Uh, so if you handle pupa, or if you take out pupa, there's not much of. Um, much of changes that happen, or it is not going to uh, affect the moth. Just like you know, people say when you take a bird egg, you should not the bird orient egg orientation should be in a such in a certain in in certain way so that the eggs don't um, the eggs can hatch. But in moths, it's not a it's not so. But that doesn't mean that you can actually uh, handle the pupa. I'm just saying for study purposes, I have done this. So you can take the pupa, you can measure it, and again put it back where it belonged, and um, the moth will come out. And uh, so the moths which uh, actually go uh, underground, they uh, the pupa actually crawls crawls to the surface of the ground as a pupa. It crawls, and then the adult emerges just above the ground. So pupa has a mechanism to travel. So there are hooks. At the base of the pupa, which helps them to uh, travel. This is very something interesting. I I found it. I found it very fascinating to imagine a pupa actually crawling up. So there are different kinds of pupa. So uh, so the cocoons. Now look at this part. This kind of cocoon is like a hammock. 
So I mentioned that the cocoons are like a protective uh, cover to the pupa, which means that the moth doesn't want anybody to know that there is a pupa inside the cocoon. So therefore, they are very camouflaged. But some distasteful species, such as this one, the, the tiger moth, they have poison in their body. The caterpillar is poisonous, the pupa is poisonous, so the adult is poisonous. So they have nothing to fear of. But they have a responsibility to communicate to the predators that, hey, don't try me, I'm poisonous. So how do they communicate? So they communicate like as in the caterpillar stages and in the adult stages, they communicate it through bright colors, which is called warning colors. But in pupil stage, how can one can communicate? Communicate. So here it is. So this pupa is almost like challenging the predators. Come and get me if you can. You know that kind of stuff. So it is sitting in a very transparent cocoon, yet very much visible. And yet it is empty. So you can see the pupa color is also bright yellow. Usually pupa colors are not bright yellow. You can see this another pupa down there. They usually dark maroon or dark brown color because they are supposed to be camouflage. But this one is doesn't need any camouflage. It is just using the color and this entire um, attire for communication to the predator that I am distasteful. So in the pupil stage, uh, the changes that happens is that the caterpillar is changing into an adult. So literally all the body organs of the caterpillar gets dissolved and some it's like a living tissue uh, liquid of living tissue is, is developed and then that liquid is again used to, to form the organs of the adult moth. So this transition period is completely immobile period and um, non-feeding period. But the pupa, as I said, has an ability to move. So if you try to touch it, it will, it will, you know, it will, it will try to shiver or it will try to move a bit. Uh, so that's the, and as the time comes closer, the pupa also becomes almost translucent that one can see the adult moth uh, inside, uh, inside the pupa. And when the time of emergence comes, so uh, if it is a silk cocoon, uh, so the moths uh, secrete a chemical which actually liquefies the uh, strands of silk. And that's the reason in sericulture they don't allow moths to emerge, but till then in the cocoon stage, because cocoon is having one entire silk thread. Like in the silk cocoon, uh, it has been found that nearly a kilometer long, the thread could be a kilometer long. It is a single thread that is wound around the body to form the cocoon. So the sericulturists need that one single strand of one kilometer long. They don't want it to be broken into multiple pieces and therefore they kill the uh, kill the moth. So here you can see the moth has used the silk, uh, the liquid to break open the and that's how it uh, emerges. I also already mentioned the underground pupa, how they emerge. In the leaf litter, they plainly just walk out of the pupa. That's it. Because the leaf litter pupa is, leaf, leaf litter cocoon is very loose. It's not really very uh, solid kind of thing. So it's very easy to come out. So the moment the moth comes out, usually this is what happens. So if it is a female moth, she will try to stay closer to the place where she has emerged and she will release these chemicals in the air, okay, which are called pheromones. And this pheromones like act like you know, like our mobile phones, you know, the radiations has reached, the male antenna picks up the radiations, the male zooms down to the female. So mating happens. And here you can see the antenna, the feathery antenna. So moths again, the the, uh, uh, the major difference between a moth and a butterfly is an antenna. Moths have a variety of antenna, uh, like this one, and butterflies have just simple plane with a clubbed end antenna. So males have broader antenna in some species. Not all species have this. Some species have broader antenna to pick up the signs of the female, and females have narrow uh, antenna. So the mating happens, and immediately after mating, the female starts laying eggs, and these will be the moths who are non-feeding moths. Like they're non feeders, so they for them it is a task they have to get over it, they have to finish. If the mating doesn't happen at this time, the female will anyway lay eggs. As I said, it is a task that they have to finish it off, they don't have time to wait for the male, and then so the eggs are unfertilized. So, in, uh, in case of unfertilized eggs, the eggs will not have, they'll just shrink. If you see some eggs which have just shrunken, so be sure that the eggs were unfertilized. But in some cases, like especially in emperor moths. Um, uh, what is called this um, virgin but parthenogenesis is recorded that unfertilized eggs also can hatch into um, the caterpillar. So this is like parthenogenesis is, is a 
is a tool or is a technique which is available with them in case of adversity when there is no male available available or some extinction of species is happening or something so this is where in a very rare rare situation this is used actually and it is not for every species again it's only in emperor moths uh, so far it is been uh, recorded emperor moths are the group to which the atlas moth the sasit moth moon moth they all uh, uh, belong to this group and when the time comes of emergence where when they have emerged so they need space to you know blow out their uh, wings which is like a balloon so if you think of atlas moth which is like almost 1 foot long uh, moth so you may think that the pupa may be having that long wings no the wings are just like tiny buds inside the inside the pupa uh, when it is in a pupal stage and those buds are like balloons so the when it emerges from the cocoon it has to hang upside down so that with the gravity the body the lymph which is the blood gets pumped into the wings and that pumping for that pumping process it needs a space so if you're rearing a bigger caterpillar in a smaller jar then the moth will remain crippled like this in this picture you can see the moth will remain crippled like this throughout it, for its life and it will not survive also because it will just get easily predated so uh, for uh, unfolding the wings and to blowing the bigger they need space so um, therefore bigger jars have to be taken whenever you're rearing um, uh, bigger caterpillars so that that is a process and it will take some time maybe an hour or two for the moth to even dry up its wings and be ready to take a uh, take take a flight ab uh, now this is this is a normal any moth which is winged moth but there are many species which are also having wingless females they don't fly at all they don't have wings also so one of the you you would have seen bag worms uh, which are like bag worms are also caterpillars they move they only have bags around it the so female bag worms when they emerge from their bags they are wingless they just uh, release the pheromones and uh, the male gets attracted they mate over there and they die in the same bag you know the bag is where the life started for her and the female dies in the same bag because when the ba- as the baby when the eggs are hatched the baby makes their own tiny tiny bags so they keep on adding one one floor as they keep on growing so the female also started her life like that and she eventually j- died so male only has the wings and females do not have wings so this is a this is a nature's design of protecting female species nature didn't want that the female species should be exposed to predation exposed to you know flying and getting killed because they are the holding the future progeny so they need to be protected so winglessness is is a is a special uh, adaptation for female species to so that they can procreate but in this entire story of you know starting from the caterpillar stage to the adult stage it appears to be it's a good nice fairy tale kind of thing but well it is not a fairy tale for the caterpillars there is always roadblocks and always there are mischiefs and always that not that all caterpillars can make to the adult wood uh, forget about the predation which is eaten by birds no so people who are into birds you know who observe birds who love birds i always tell them that by default you should love insects by default you should observe insects also because this is what your birds are eating on so so insects form the dominant food protein available in nature for many of the animals who are depending on animal protein so insects provide that so that is a that is a most crucial role insects are playing in in ecosystem because in, insects are in large numbers their diversity is much higher compared to any species therefore the amount of food which is available is also ample food is available so birds the caterpillars are mostly eaten by birds and rep- then amphibians then other uh, insects like praying mantises dragonflies but birds are the main main predators of it so not talking about the predation we are talking about parasitization so there are this different kind of paras- parasites who actually uh parasitize the caterpillar so there is a technid was there is a eclumen was so here you can see the eclumen was she is having a long tube egg-laying tube she is inserting into the caterpillar body she is releasing her eggs inside it and as the caterpillar is growing uh, so this is the parasite grows inside the caterpillar body but it doesn't kill the caterpillar it is slowly eating un- you know unwanted or or uh, organs which are not very vital for the caterpillar survival and when the time comes when the caterpillar is fully matured when the caterpillar is ready for pupation that is the time when the 
uh, the parasites uh, parasites actually mature and they start coming out of the body because they sense that now the caterpillar is about to go it get into pupation it is our time to come up and then they kill they eat up all the vital organs of the caterpillar they kill the caterpillar they come out of the caterpillar body here you can see all you know these are all wasp cocoons tiny cocoons there's a uh, braconid wasp um, cocoons are there so they all actually have come out and made their own cocoons the uh, the grubs have made their own cocoons and they will be emerging from it and sometimes nematodes also so here you can see this is a this is zygnet this is zygnet or burnet moth caterpillar uh, very in fact they very poisonous also they have uh, cyanide had it been cyanide in the body uh, yet you can see that this is in parasitic and nematodes so nematodes is another another uh, way of parasiting so you, you have long long you know almost i measured this one nematode was almost like 12 cm long that long worm had come out of the body sometimes it will be one worm sometimes four to five worms come out so they might kill the caterpillar so the caterpillar usually doesn't reach to the pupal stage even if it reaches to the pupal stage there is a second level of parasitization or the second different type of like one parasitization is to kill the caterpillar stage second parasitization is to kill the pupa only the like the adult is not emerging So if you are waiting for the moth tumor, then you'll find a big wasp is coming out of it, or you are seeing a couple of acne flies coming out of it. So these are the like you know uh, hindrances for the in the life history journey of a caterpillar. Okay, so if you want to rear a caterpillar, and if you want to study caterpillar, so this is what you need to do, and this is the right time. Monsoon is the right time. Somewhere from June onwards till October uh, is a very good time uh, where the monsoon uh, is active, and you get to see lots of caterpillar. and i always tell people that you know the first caterpillar you see for a season i bet it is a moth caterpillar because the diversity as i said the diversity is so high that you will be seeing more of the moth caterpillars and lesser of butterfly caterpillars so if you don't know how to differentiate between a butterfly and a moth caterpillar i said just leave that aside you anyway rare a caterpillar let's see what comes out of it yeah as i said the chances are that you coming into a butterfly unless you are uh, you have a lemon plant or a curry leaf plant in your garden and you find a caterpillar those will mostly a butterfly caterpillar okay so caterpillar so one is that you have to collect caterpillar only when you see the caterpillar feeding on a plant so there are different uh, there are moths the caterpillars which are feeding on non plant material also like some feed on moss some are feeding on lichens fungus so bark also so you are not going to collect those fish only if you are going to find plant eating caterpillars collect them don't collect caterpillar which are on the pond on the ground you don't collect caterpillar which is found on an unnatural surface because you don't know which host plant it will feed on because i usually get this kind of whatsapp messages that i found this caterpillar it was it was just on the road Uh, I think it does not tell me what I should feed. I don't have. I'm not a doctor, caterpillar. Okay, that you can just. So, what will happen? So, what will happen? You know, I can't really tell because we haven't reached to that stage where anybody can tell this. The best is that collect the caterpillar only when it is on the host plant, and that to see if you can see some half of the leaves on the tree. You can see half of the leaves and and some droppings below. So, caterpillar droppings look like black pepper. So if you can see some black pepper kind of thing fallen down, then be sure that there is an active caterpillar. So one is that collect the caterpillar. Since you don't know whether the caterpillar is going to grow big or small, it's okay. You just go and put it in a one kg plastic jar, a pet jar. You know. So just take a jar which can can just make some holes for um, around the uh, on the lid as well as around the jar for aeration <coughs> circulation purpose. Technically, insects don't need too much of air. If you if you put them into into a container for where there is no air for few days, the caterpillar doesn't die. But I do I won't say you should do that. I'm just saying that it does need some amount of air. So just make some uh, holes uh, in the jar. Uh, try to keep a tissue paper at the base of the um, uh, jar so that whatever droppings fall, uh, it will be very easy to clear it. You know, you can just replace with a new tissue paper. and also the tissue paper absorbs all the moisture which is there because you are keeping in a very in a in a in an artificial environment now because you evicted it from the wild and you are keeping in an artificial environment so uh, so the moisture content could become very high and that can induce you know fungal or uh, fungal infections in the caterpillar the so best is to keep it well aerated and moisture free and um, give the caterpillar regularly fresh leaves 
But just because you brought the caterpillar home, it doesn't mean that it has it is supposed to eat the stale food. So best uh, you can collect the host plant leaves and stack them in your fridge um, in an airtight uh, bag in the vegetable tray section. The way we keep our vegetables fresh, you can keep the leaves at least fresh for four to five days. Say if if the place from where you collect the caterpillar is very far. So um, give give them branches like twigs. Don't give single single leaf because the caterpillar has a way of feeding. It will cling to the twig and then it will feed on the leaf. So if you give the only leaves, it won't be able to feed it. It is not so it will be like you know very uh, messy for the caterpillar to just be uh, in its own droppings and feed on the leaves also. So just keep twigs so that it can uh, it can climb on it and feed on it. And uh, uh, if you want to keep the um, variation uh, within the outside uh, climate and inside climate uh, almost same, so I would suggest that you keep it in a windowsill. So that the climate is very much similar. Like for example, if it's raining outside, your caterpillar is not experiencing the rain, but at least that moisture or that humidity levels it can experience if you keep it in the window. Now, wow! If you have kept the caterpillars like that in window unprotected, uh, then be sure that your caterpillars are eaten away by ants because ants eventually find them. So you can apply a petroleum jelly at the base of the caterpillar. Uh, sorry, base of the jar. Or keep the jar in a plate of in a plate of uh, water. So that is a deterrent for ants. They don't they can't uh, go into uh, into that. And never uh, keep too many caterpillars in one jar. Try to keep maximum two caterpillars you can keep, but don't keep too many of them because then it will be very difficult for you to even you, even to find out the data which caterpillar pupated, which didn't pupate, you know all that. So best is to keep them and label them. You don't know the name. You don't. Know, it's okay. Caterpillar C one. Under the category C two, something like that. You just keep label, and the label itself you can write that on the date you brought it, the caterpillar, and just note down that. So that's it. So you can have too many jars. So so when I was doing my masters, that meant like it's like you know I'm, I was having like all the pickle jars kind of thing in my room, all different with the bottles, uh, jars with all the numbers. It was just very crazy, and my mother used to not like it because uh, my mother was insect topic, so she really didn't like what I was doing, you know. So, so all this, so this, so you can only rare caterp rare caterpillars as many as you can manage, because it can become a very taxing work if you have too many caterpillars. So be sure that every day at least you'll be spending fifteen to twenty minutes with your caterpillar, cleaning all the droppings and taking the measurements and all that. So you have to keep that kind of time on daily basis, not that just once in a week. On a daily basis, you need to do so. Uh, based on that, decide that how many caterpillars you want to um, rare. And when you see a cat, when you see caterpillars on the plant, if there are five caterpillars, don't collect all five caterpillars. Just take one or two, and leave rest of them over there. Okay, so that way you are not really uh, creating an creating a negative impact by your that your study is having a negative impact on the caterpillar population. So just try to take one. I would suggest just start with one. Once you get confidence, then you take the uh, next one. So uh, notes is what you have to uh, make mention, and as I already mentioned, that in caterpillar, uh, the instars, as per the instars, the body shape and color, then everything starts changing. You can note down all these behavioral changes also uh, in the in the caterpillar. A caterpillar jar should look like this, something which I've mentioned uh, shown here. And this is what you know color change uh, happens within the same species. Here you can see one a green form, brown form. So uh, when you start reading up literature, you will come across this uh, uh, terms: dry form, uh, wet form, green form, brown form. So these are because as uh, the seasonal changes or microclimate changes can induce these changes. But sometimes I've seen like there, uh, I have seen that browner caterpillars. I was able to see at the end of the monsoon. But sometimes I've seen brown caterpillars even monsoon time. So I don't know what um, what really happens in in this change in color. But this is what. But you should be sure that this, they are not two different species, but they are same species. It's just that uh, the um, uh, color change is just part of it. And when the moth emerges, the moth emerges usually happens uh, usually late evenings. Late evenings when they are about to, so that they can fly. If your moth has emerged. Sometimes early morning, because in nature, early morning still they can fly and find a shelter and be there and be active in the evening time. 
but if it is in your if it is in your home so i would suggest that uh, try to when the moth emerges try to leave it on a tree bark in a sheltered area because if you keep the moth in your jar it will keep on fluttering itself and all the scales and everything it will become like uh, it will look very tattered and the scales will be uh, gone this is a data sheet uh, which i was referring that um, this is an excel data sheet which is available on this website borwing publishers is where the uh, my moth book this is this is uh, this is our own publishing house and uh, where the moth book is in published so we have kept a resource section where some data uh, is available uh, so one you can find is that you can find this data sheet uh, which you can download it also i have put a entire list of um, host plant of the moths which i have covered in my book so my book covered nearly uh, 7 774 species uh, in this uh, in the book so all that data whichever data i was able to compile i have put everything on there because putting that information in the book would have been very difficult because it's a volume of uh, information which is there uh, but there is a, um, so there is another database where i'll, I'll uh, another place where you can find uh, host plant data i'll come to that but uh, look at this data sheet it's a very simple data sheet but it is trying to capture everything of the caterpillar uh, the changes that happens so date is when you have to date is whenever you have doing the observation keep writing the date which location you collected try and have a gps location of it nowadays it has become very easy this is another twist you know uh, earlier we we had to use uh, actual gps gadgets to get the google location now in on your mobile phone itself you can get the uh, google location which you can put and so your code is something which will help you uh, to name the uh, name the specimens because you don't know the name so having the code is helpful in the first place so going by c1 if it is a moth you can do m1 so on and later on when it's get identified that's where you can mention which family it belong to which sub family it belong to what is the species name and all that so there are uh, various places where you can get moths identified but i'm not uh, i'm not saying it's very easy to identify but you can always try moths of india is a website where um, a good amount of data is uh, moth pictures are there you can go and find out but where to look for it and what to look for is is going to remain a challenge i naturally which just what i also mentioned so in on i naturally you can just go up and look up for moths uh, from india and you'll find pictures uh, over there also and yes and i have my and my field guide is also there so that's where you can identify and then host plant so in the host plant all the family is very important now i'll just explain you why family is important because uh, moths prefer to have prefer to feed on plants of the same family so if it is feeding like even you know, like rubesi if rubesi uh, is a family and then the gardenia belongs to the rubesi uh, family so the hawk moth is feeding on the gardenia but the same hawk moth will also feed on mitra gaina which is another plant from rubesi family so rubesi family it becomes a common so if i have to find an alternate i have to go and look in the rubesi family and then see which plants are around me so therefore the plant uh, family information is also important the host getting the host plant uh, identified get hold of a botanist or flora of india is also there online you can go and get this uh, identified wild flowers of india is is also uh, there trees of india all these groups are there on facebook you can post your pictures and get them identified so both the botany and the entomology aspects are covered over here so when is when you bought the caterpillar what is the length of the caterpillar you can put a caterpillar on a plain paper the caterpillar will not remain still it's there but you know you try to find the head and tail point and if you can mark it on the paper and later on with the scale you can measure it up that what was it so that is how the measuring so with that we come to know how what was the what was, what was the size of the caterpillar when it was like the newly hatched what is the size when it is about to mature what is the size so that is the life history data you know is is missing right now so you can add that information what was the color when you brought it and then whether it pupate uh, whether it changed the uh, whether molting happened so in the when it molting happened did the color change so all that you can document so as in so either you can do your, like during my research day, during my research years i was doing on daily basis but you can do on uh, as in when the caterpillar shells the skin so with that you can keep on noting the date then the date when the caterpillar got, had undergone for the has gone for the pupation what medium it chose which date it emerged you got the pupation duration also you so we need to have a caterpillar duration what is the caterpillar stage how many days it feeds in the caterpillar stage and what is the pupal stage and adult 
life span is a different story of course but at least you get the pupal stage and the caterpillar stage through this method and if there any information you want to write additional so you can always write that additional information so you can maintain this data uh, in this form and you can analyze and in the same if you go uh, on the same sheet there's an adult data uh, you can see the second sheet over here which i mentioned adult data the moths data so you can go and check the in the similar fa fashion only the moth data can be also documented so you can download this sheet and you can start uh, you know uh, building up this data database for wherever you are so this is a this is a site you should go of uh, natural history museum where it's a world records are there like world records of all the host plants of all the lepidopteran species this is for lepidopteria so you get both birds butterflies and moths both information is there so your the search is there country wise region wise family wise species wise moth species wise or plant family wise you can look for the information and then that is very helpful i built up that the data which i was talking to you about of the larva fruit plants i used this place to compile that so you can also um, go and check the site so that's that's pretty much uh, what i wanted to uh, speak about and uh, i think if you have been uh, writing questions here i can't see it because i'm not able to see the screen and just seeing my slides so i'll just uh, stop sharing yeah so thank you ma'am yeah dear participants uh, the session is open for the questions john singh sir your mic is on mute yeah yeah i have two questions yes, you know uh, there is a common saying that if the scales of the moth fall on your eyes you will go blind is it true <laughs> no sir because i have looked into moth so often <laughs> but you are wearing the sun glasses you know you are protecting your suppose that you are not wearing glasses <laughs> and the scales fall into your eyes what will no, happen no nothing nothing happens sir nothing happens no nothing Okay, then what is the remedy for the stinging hair of these cattle pullets? Yeah, yes, stinging hair. Yes, stinging hair uh, is. Uh, I think um, uh, calamine. Cactus calamine is uh, is a soothing lotion which even is given for tick bites. Uh, so that lotion is uh, something useful. Uh, but usually, like if it is not very acute, uh, it goes away within few hours. um uh, just applying them this soothing lotion is just good enough but uh, people who are more uh, like allergic uh, they might develop some secondary reactions to it so that's where they have to visit uh, see a doctor uh, for that very rarely this has happened like i have also got uh, branch or something but that's never like it's just for few this was it's just been temporary you know there is a very interesting observation on the lion tail macaws in peria tiger reserve observed by a german actually mm. they collected the caterpillars put it in the leaf and rolled it and uh, they got rid of the stinging hairs and then after that they ate the caterpillar mm. tool using tool using yes. in the lion tail yes anyway, yes thank you very much for your yes. presentation thank you yeah. sir thank you sir Ma'am, uh, uh, Mr. Ningxian uh, has one question. Mm -hmm. uh, he's saying, uh, "Madam, please suggest one good book on moths that can be found in India." So my book itself, I was telling the field guide of. Uh, let me find a book. Hold on, uh, I didn't. Just a minute. If I have my book, I'll show you. Uh, Isaac Ji. Isaac Ji. So no book, then a book. Uh, so my book is uh, available. Uh, um, there's a field guide to Indian moths. That is one book. Uh, so there is uh, unfortunately no other book uh, to say. This is the um, uh, this is a book um, available uh, right now. It's available on Amazon uh, also. This one, and uh, this is uh, is completely pictorial book. It's like a field guide. So this is a book. We'll get to Indian moths, and as I said, Moths of India website is also there. One can go and check um, that site also. 
uh, for um, moth identification purpose. Okay, there's a Pradnyan question is there. Um, I have observed many different species of moths in my apartment in a different season of the year, different size and color. I wish to document all three. How do I do that? So you use the same, uh, you can just use a data sheet, which I just mentioned, uh, the adult data sheet is also there. So you have to just uh, make a record of, keep on taking photographs and make a record of that, which all, like, as I said, you can write M1, M2 and all that. Your photographs itself, you can uh, name them also as M1 and later on when the name comes, the code remains the same. So you know that the, which code was uh, assigned for which picture. And then when the name comes, you can fill in that data. So you can do that, and um, you can also uh, maintain the in in the moth uh, data sheet. I have put up a uh, section of weather information. You can you need to check the uh, climate weather information, the rainfall data, humidity data, and temperatures because they play a very important role in moth uh, frequent like you know the sightings. So even later at later part of day, you can compare the data with help of the weather data. So try to do that way. Take a photograph and uh, code them and get them identified. That's it. That's all you have to do. Hmm. Thank you so much. Ganesh is asking about the preservation techniques. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Ganesh. You know, I'm I have done. Uh, my study is completely ecological study, which means that I have not done any collection. I've done, I've not done any, I've, because that's mostly taxonomist uh, do. Uh, so I may not really, um, I, I'm not the right person to talk about that. Uh, maybe some taxonomist can uh, help you with that. Why are skippers considered? Yes, I think the Sima the skippers, uh, skippers, skippers are. I think someone just mute their mic. I think Diksha, your mic, uh, you can mute. Yeah. Um, so skippers in the evolutionary. Uh, in the evolution, if you try to see that the moths, so the in the evolution, moths came first, then came the butterflies, and so if you look at the evolution of butterflies, the skippers. Uh, came for so therefore they have this like very moth like appearance so therefore it is like the food is called probably intermediate uh, stage you know like before uh, in fact the kind of um, uh, hook hook like uh, antennae which uh, skippers have there are some moths in South America who have this kind of skipper like antennae also yeah. okay yeah, if there are any other questions, because I probably, uh, I can't really like, browse through that, so the moderators can help me. If there are any more uh, questions. Um, okay. Ma'am, there is another question asked by Pradnyan, how to start identifying moths? So one is that uh, identifying moths is, as I said, that you have to start looking at the, the, the shape. You look at the shape, the way the moth is sitting. Uh, if the moth is uh, showing all four wings or just uh, folding the wings behind. So it is a shape, similar shapes is what is one uh, way of uh, looking at it. And then now moth, uh, to do the moth identification, it's, it's, a, it's a very complex thing for reason that there is no standard rule that if the moth is sitting like this, then it is this family. No, it is not like that because there is an exception for everything. So therefore it is very complex. So if you start reading a bit of moth families, and uh, a bit about their uh, habits that how the moth is feeding or how it is sitting and what are different changes can and you see the members of that then you'll come to know that like for example there is one group of moths who always have their under wing color very bright they could be just yellow or red and they're usually black 
are like usually big and their front wings are very dull and drab. So this kind of patterns, if you try to see, then you try to find out, oh, to which family this moth belongs. So this family is Eribidi, the subfamily is Eribini. Okay, so that, so that is where it starts, you know, from there. So look at for the similarities, look for similarities. For example, um, all emperor moths, they're large, no doubt about it. But um, there is another group of moths, they're also very large. So how do you differentiate between an emperor moth and an, um, uh, that monkey moth group is that the emperor moths always have eye marking on the fore wing. So the eye window, the window, transparent windows are the transparent windows are there. So those will be missing in the monkey moth. So you need to but first read about the family characteristics to know that what uh, the moth would look like and then start looking at. So it is both ways. You take a picture. Get it identified, then go and read the family, or you read the family and then go to the uh, species. Both way to it. So there is no one way of going it. It is always I have used various ways of doing it: forward, backward, upside down, because it's a very complex um, thing, and um, it's very easy to um, get frustrated. Very easy, and like people keep sending me pictures. Uh, they find one moth, and they keep sending to many experts. That which is this moth, which is this moth, which is this moth. And nobody's responding to them. And then they'll write to me, I've put this picture, but nobody's responding. Why it is like that? I said, because nobody knows what that moth is. That's the reason people are not responding. Now, if it is nobody's, oh, wow, is it a new species? I said, we don't know that also, but there's a new species. So in moths, uh, having several photos of yours unidentified is very common. I have over 1,000 pictures with me which are not identified. Which could be new one also, but no. But how do you tell that? You know, because the study itself is so uh, complicated, so it's not so easy for anybody to even tell. So wherever uh, things which are very easy and everybody will respond to, you and people will not respond to you because nobody wants to make a fool of themselves by giving a wrong name. Yeah. So if you are into, if you are trying to enter this field, so be sure that this is a very normal thing, that things will not get identified easily. And if I have to, I, um, you know, I should, but I don't do this. Very, very often people keep sending me moth pictures. Ones which can be easily identified, often I can e do it. But ones which have to pick up a book and read references and do that, I just don't do it because it takes anywhere from half a day to full day to find the name of that moth, if it is possible. So I don't have that kind of time to put in, you know. When I was writing the book, I did that. But now I have to put that one, I have to take one picture and sit and keep on referencing all my resources and doing it. It's just a very tedious job. And that's the reason I don't really help in that way. I usually tell people, please go and post the picture on the Indian Moths Facebook group. There are many experts. Just came as the time over to look coin up identify curry dega because it's really taxing. It's really taxing to identify a, a species which is not usually. So uh, my my book got delayed by many, many years for reason because I wanted to cover nearly 1,500 species in my book. And somewhere I was not reaching that number because the pictures were not getting identified. And experts who are like more of foreign experts, they all said, you know, it is specimen, you need a specimen. Why? Because moth coloration from the, from the external wing coloration alone, you can't identify them. Sometimes you need the under wing color and sometimes you need the reverse color also of the moth. How does the moth look on the reverse side? So for this, a specimen is very much needed. And so specimen means you need to have proper preservation techniques. You need to have proper storage. I was not really keen to, like, I didn't have that kind of facility. I didn't want to do also. So I leave that job to the taxonomists who are doing it. So the taxonomists is able to, say, I have not discovered a single moth because I'm not into that field of, I'm, I'm into ecology. I'm a field person. You, you tell me about moth behavior. You tell me about how moths, behave on the light sheet or what happens. I can talk all about that, but I can't really tell much about the taxonomy uh, aspect. So it is it is very complex, but but that's the thing that if you are very interested, keep motivating yourself that uh, you'll have to spend more and more time. And that is what the sector uh, needs because um, the younger generation needs everything so faster and quick that things you don't see results in shorter time, then you just give up. So moths is not that feeling. In moths, you have to be patient. So if you're patient, eventually, you know, now when I'm going to write my second edition of my book, all those species which I was unable to identify, I'll get sit again and I'll try to see if I can add more species uh, to my uh, book. 
so that's how one can start off uh, so if i i hope i answered your question um uh, pragnan okay then there is another question from dr manoj borkar sir uh, he is asking is there any one working on skippers particularly yeah yeah butterflies are people are working on butterflies i don't know who is working on skippers particularly but there are people butterflies every aspect is covered you know because in butterflies there are only six families six families so you will find people working on the six families but where you will find people working on 40 families that is what moths is moths is having 40 families so um, butterflies i think uh, there is a site uh, of butterfly india there one can go and find out if anybody is uh, into skippers i don't know much about uh, uh, about that part ma'am there is another question from seema vishwakarma why are skippers considered intermediate form between butterflies and moths i think i answered that uh, yeah. part i answered okay. that part i saw that uh, question okay ma'am so okay so is there any more questions i can take or else i can um, uh, end my session thank you so much ma'am thank you dr trija thank you ma'am for a wonderful and highly informative session on moths i'm sure the participants will be surely benefited with the knowledge you received once again thank you very much thank you so much for having me i'll take your leave then good day ma'am mary quiz mary quiz uh, ms wizel to introduce the uh, resource person for the webinar La good afternoon everyone the last session for today is on the topic wildlife management legislation and career prospects and it is going to be delivered by shri damodar prakash salelkar shri salelkar is currently serving as a goa forest at goa forest department as an assistant conservator of forest he has completed his master of science in biodiversity from pune university He has also completed his postgraduate diploma in forestry and wildlife management from Andhra Pradesh Forest Academy Hyderabad and Central Academy for State Forest Services. He has carried out the inventory of amphibian fauna of Bhagwan Mahavir Wildlife Sanctuary Molem and also conducted phylogenetic study of morphometric variation in four species of amphibians. in four different zones of western ghats shri salelkar has also carried out studies on man and animal conflict mitigation strategy in goa he has done various case studies on implementation of forest right act 2006 in goa human wildlife conflict in gir national park park implementation of forest in ratnagiri district of uh, maharashtra and eco development in anamalai tiger reserve tamil nadu shri salelkar has also completed several projects and also has research publication to his credit i now request shri salelkar to deliver his session कुछ काम करेंगे सर सलेलकर सो कुड यू प्लीज अनम्यूट योर माइक एम आई ऑडिबल नाउ यस सर and my presentation is visible no sir you have not shared your screen no yes sir now the slides are visible
I think I am uh, unable to change the slides. So can you end your presentation? I will share the PPT on your behalf. Uh, Yes, sir, you can start. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon all. Uh, today my topic is uh, about wildlife management uh, legal aspects. Uh, and uh, also I'm talking about uh, uh, first, uh, future prospects in uh, forest development, forest department. Uh, Actually, uh, I am very much fortunate to uh, present in this uh, uh, between this eminent personalities like Dr. Ajit John Singh, uh, Dr. Varad Giri, and Dr. Shibhulak Singh. Uh, it is to present like uh, topic like wildlife management in front of Dr. Uh, John Singh sir is really a blessing. Uh, I can I hope to uh, have some uh, inputs from him. Uh, so, uh, since the topic is uh, long, I will start my presentation. Uh, actually, wildlife uh, management is uh, defined as the science of managing wildlife and its uh, habitat, including man and for uh, benefit of entire biota, which includes man, uh, animal, and uh, other things. Next. A uh, niche. Uh, niche is uh, considered as uh, the role of uh, role or job of the job of the organism. Uh, like plants are producers, uh, they share their uh, habitat. Uh, whatever nutrients are there, they rotate among the uh, various organisms. Uh, grazers, browsers. Uh, Frugivores, nectar, uh, nectarivores. There are different uh, things which which uh, it can take the uh, nutrient from one form to another form. Like uh, when grass grows, it is eaten by mouse and a uh, elephant at the same time. But mouse gives it to other uh, organism. Uh, mouse has many predators. Then uh, it is in rotation. So and same time the elephant elephant uh, can elephant just eats that and defecates on the defecation there are many uh, small small organisms which live on the defecation of the elephant like the nutrients are uh, rotated next please uh, in niche there are generally species and fishery species uh, generally, start, uh, those who have broad uh, variety of habitat type, like uh, uh, you can consider a leopard, uh, which feeds on uh, various uh, organisms. Uh, the, the leopard can feed on uh, a bandicoot to a, a deer. They, they, can, uh, they can sustain in many ecosystems so that they have a broad niche. Whereas 
like tiger tiger feed on particular uh, species of the deer hence they have a common this next next question uh now talking about the habitat uh, habitat is uh, mostly uh, environment which supplies everything to the organism like food cover water space uh, the food both quality and quantity is important for sustenance of the uh, wild animal cover is necessary for breeding feeding uh, spraying etc uh, the water includes surface water dew water snow water the water which is present in the juicy vegetation is also very important for wildlife the space uh, for avoid, avoiding overcrowding mostly the overcrowding is uh, important because uh, of parasites parasites and diseases if the space is very very much less then uh, there is the disease transmission is much more in them next next please limiting factors uh uh the limiting factors are uh limiting factors are those factors which are uh density uh, there are two types of uh, limiting factors limiting factors those are uh, which are controlled the number of the uh, individual or the distribution uh, uh limiting factors are density dependent limit uh, they depend on the population size competition uh, predation disease parasites etc the density independent uh, are natural disaster seasonal cycles human activity and weeds uh, as per uh, while management is concerned the weeds are very important weed control is most important because uh, next slide please weeds are un unwanted uh, unpalatable obnoxious uh, species which occupy uh, the space thereby hindering the uh growth of palatable species uh they are hindering the uh smooth functioning of food chains and all the things uh mostly the uh mostly they control a growth of other species which are very important for wildlife like some uh, commercial species also act as uh, uh weeds uh like coffee coffee uh, is distributed by uh, dispersed by uh, civet cats in anamalai uh, which which causes uh, habitat uh, loss in many places there is no grass and other species grow in anamalai then other uh, weeds uh, include cassia tora chromelina odoleta ruptis valensis and lantana camera ipomia uh, carnia etc then after weeds the uh, human activities are uh, also uh, play an important role in dispersing the wildlife like hunting poaching uh, illegal uh, felling grazing collection of small woods uh, timber fencing poles firewood shifting agriculture uh, there are uh, construction of dam power power line windmills road industries etc next slide please next uh this you can see this is a, a cassia tora you can you can't find a, a wild boar uh, which is traveling through that and though uh, uh, it is a leguminosy family and sylvinaceae uh, it doesn't add up to any anything to soil but it covers the entire area next uh 
this is copy in a number line. Next. Enumeration and assessment of population. Actually, enumeration and assessment is very important uh, as uh, we don't know how many and how much, where they are present. You can't decide for them. So we need them, uh, their numbers, their position, and their distribution. Next. This is a camera trap, uh, you can see. Uh, you can do camera trap uh, study, biodiversity study, uh, bird count, inventories, which will give us the population of the uh, whatever uh, herbivores and carnivores present in the system. Next. Uh, this is a, a black panther, uh, which is seen in Nitravadi. Next. This is the core. Uh, now, in this photo, you can see uh, the photo is taken very closely, closely. But this core was alone, and it was uh, so much uh, uh, habilitated to the people that it used to come to very close, close to humans. So this photograph is very close. Next, diagnosis of limitation. Uh, on the data available from the record and uh, uh, resources, trend fluctuations, uh, we can uh, the limitations can be diagnosed and then uh, it can be processed. Next, next slide, please. Uh, the treatment of limitation uh, habitat improvement uh, includes uh, maintaining of grass plot, creation of grass plot, creation of fodder plots. Creation of artificial waterholes, uh, maintaining uh, the natural waterholes, salt lakes, etc. Next. Uh, this is the uh, grass plot uh, at Rauna uh, which is uh, part of uh, Nitravi Wildlife Sanctuary. Uh, we could identify uh, some species like Apulda uh, species, then Aristida, uh, uh ciliaris, then Cynodon. Uh, two species which are locally called as Karpil and Gundio are uh, well grown in this area. Next. Uh, this is uh, a grass plot at Kotiga Wildlife Sanctuary. Uh, the grass species is identified as. Uh, Guinea grass. Next. The grass plot mentioned at, uh, maintained at Kana, uh, Kana Tiger Reserve. Uh, actually, uh, this, this, was, this photograph was taken during my field trip. Uh, next. You can see uh, there is a fencing. Uh, you can see and uh, the, uh, on, on your right side, you can see uh, the herbivores roaming. Actually, they are uh, fencing the area and they are letting the grass to grow. After once, once the grass, grass on the other side recedes, they open the fence and let them go to the other, other grass plot. Uh, by doing this, they can maintain the uh, quality and quantity of the grass. Next. Uh, this is a grass plot at Panna, Tiger, uh, Panna National Park. You can see uh, uh, you can see an elephant here in the bull roaming. Uh, it is both negative and positive thing. Uh, the bull is enjoying a, a shorter grass, and you can see if uh, you see properly, then uh, the uh, elephant is all also feeding on the coarse grass. This is the, uh, uh, this one for both the like uh, this uh, this is the grass plot created at Kutiga Wildlife Sanctuary. Next, uh, this is a grass plot in uh, Nidravi Wildlife Sanctuary. Next, nursery. Uh, nursery is uh, we have a fruit bearing uh, species nursery uh, in both the ranges. And we are uh, doing that uh, nursery. Uh, we are raising tall children for uh, plantation in the plantation. Next. 
this is a, a fruit bearing species plantation at netravali uh, you can see uh, that that the plants which are planted are tied with the thorny bushes so that they are not uh, predated by uh, herbivores uh, which roam inside that area next this is a mine reclamation plantation bearing uh, species next uh this is a mine reclamation with fruit bearing species uh and grass species next this is a natural water hole uh, you can see a leopard sitting on that uh, log next uh this is a desilting of uh, water hole where usually uh, we we do the desilting every alternate year uh because we have we are removing the silt and keeping out uh, keeping that silt on the bank of the uh, same water water body which get uh, again eroded and uh, fills the uh, water body actually some uh, some people they ask us that why we are not removing that silt and uh, placing it somewhere else with that silt uh, itself contain some salts which are leaked by the uh, wild animals next uh this is a natural water hole at uh, kutinga wildlife sanctuary uh it is having a watch tower also next this is a sol solar power water hole from wellowing pond at meerga tiger reserve uh the wellowing points uh, are very necessary for uh, herbivores like sambar and also for wild boars because wellowing itself or uh, if you find it in dictionary Uh, or hindi translation it is uh, like uh, anandamay jivan like it, it it comes like that uh, so wellowing makes them happy and it is a need it is much needed for them uh, but it should not be in water holes because while uh, they they wellow most of their uh, parasites and their uh, sense body uh, sense they dissolve in the water so other organism did uh, other herbi uh, herbivores they don't come come to drink that water next uh this is a wind power uh, water hole from wellowing pond in gir national park next uh this is a artificial water hole from percolation pond uh, at netravi wildlife sanctuary uh the percolation uh, is uh, very necessary so we have uh, dug it uh, in the crescent uh, manner and in center uh, we have a little part which is covered with polybag so when the uh, water get uh, evaporated or reduced uh, the uh, water at the center uh, where the where you can see the stick remains con continuously uh, for long longer time next uh this is the water filled by the uh, filled in the uh, another water hole next uh this is a cemented uh, water hole uh, another type of uh, water hole which is uh which we can fill with uh, tanker or uh, mobile uh, tanker uh, in summer season to get in the water to the wildlife next actually this is artificial water hole at bondla uh, it is a smaller water hole the size of the water hole uh, should be uh, as per the need of the wildlife if you big uh, if you dig a uh, big bigger water hole means you have to fill it uh, uh, once or twice but uh, it will occupy more more space next uh this is a uh, water hole uh, which we have uh, constructed out of a small trough uh, cemented water trough actually uh, the idea behind this was uh, this this is in very far away from the road so you can't make a road to uh, fill this water hole so this water hole can be uh, filled by the laborers 
the liver uh, will carry uh, a 16 liter uh, tank or uh, something like that uh, 16 liter uh, small uh, water pot and fill this uh, water hole the another thing is this is in bondla uh, so bondla we have staff which work uh, alternately in uh, wildlife sanctuary as, well, as well as zoo so by by the default uh, working style uh, one of the uh, uh, laborer was cleaning this stuff daily it was observed in uh, entire vegetation was also uh, removed and it was very clean and neat like uh, he, he used to keep in tiger enclosure or uh, other enclosures uh, so when when a camera trap was laid there was no wildlife in this uh, area means it was not used by any any of the herbivores or uh, any of the animals so it was thought that uh, it should be left uh, as it is so now it is vegetated uh, in and around it is full with moss and it is black but it is used by uh, wildlife yes. this is salty uh, mostly the salt licks are uh, to give the uh, mineral needs of the wildlife uh, in in jaldapara and uh, baksa tiger reserve they create the salt lick with uh, they have jaggery to uh, the salt lick but this is a uh, salt lick which is available uh, with veterinary uh, department uh, it is having calcium uh, magnesium some salts and so like we can create the water hole by uh, uh, salt lick by adding some uh, salt inside the river but basically we don't feel need uh, for salt lick uh, in our area because we are very near to coastal area and there is a lot of salt available next soil and moisture conservation uh, soil and moisture conservation is a very uh, important uh, aspect of wildlife conservation because you need uh, water availability uh, throughout the year and for that you have to uh, catch the water uh, where it falls like that uh, in in our areas most of the uh, uh, wildlife areas are those areas which are left away uh, left after after uh, taking all the fence towards the agriculture so we need more water uh, conservation in this uh, area next the smc structures should not be big enough uh, to because we have a very small uh, places so uh, we mostly do gully plug contour bending and grass plantations uh, then brushwood dams cabian at uh, low levels in top we have this all gully plugs and all uh, we don't go for any any cats or uh, uh, what we call concrete dams because we uh, in goa we have uh, all the dams which are put uh, sluice gate dams we, uh, which are put by uh, pwd next uh, this is a uh, grass plot uh, this is a grass plantation for uh, soil and moisture conservation the uh, mostly they use the vetivers uh, for uh, plantation uh, the plantation is done in strips uh, sometimes crescent trench are uh, uh, done with the uh, uh, molds uh, which are covered with the grass next this is a gabion check dam uh, dry uh, when it was first of it next this is a gabion check dam at uh, gabion check dam uh, in panna tiger reserve next this is a loose boulder dam uh this photograph was taken during the training at uti uh, soil and water conservation training uh because the, the banks they have uh, this is the uh, model made by made by them so all the uh, this one is having the retaining wall with the uh, loose boulder dam next this is the brushwood dam uh mostly in forest uh this brushwood brushwood dams are more uh more suitable like because 
the material is readily available the streams are very uh, small like that we can construct more in uh, forest next this is debian check them when uh, full full play rain was observed next this is the habitat in kana uh, mostly they say that this is the ideal habitat for wildlife and we are achieving to a sleep next uh, you can see uh, there is a uh, big trees growing along the grass patches it is like food and cover when the food and cover are nestled together it forms a very nice habitat for uh, wildlife to breed feed and live in next control on limiting factors the control on limiting factors uh, depend on uh, control on fire uh, control on weeds control on poaching control on encroachments and control on uh, accidents which occur uh, when um, the wildlife goes uh, on the road or crossing the road next this is fire incidents at bonla actually uh, this fire incident was just uh, started when we reached we could find that uh, people are very much uh, very very intelligent uh, they, they use a cow dung stick and uh, match stick tied to them the cow dung stick was like uh, or incense stick uh, burning and when it reached the uh, match stick it got burned and this fire was started so we uh, we had a meeting with uh, all the person in the gram uh, gram panchayat all nearby residents and we asked them why why the, uh, the fire is there in this so at that time there was a uh, epidemic of uh, caesar forest disease in goa so most of the people they thought that by burning this all the litter they will uh, kill all the ticks so they won't get the infection but actually we we told them if you burn that uh, entire area you will get the uh, the uh, caesar forest disease whom whom the delivered you are, you don't have to come to the forest because uh, mostly the langurs are the uh, carriers of this disease so when you burn this area the entire vegetation will burn the once the vegetation is burn and uh, unpalatable the langur will come to your home and you will be home delivered with the caesar forest disease uh, next uh, this is a fire fighting uh, at nitravai wildlife sanctuary uh, next uh, hacking and poaching uh, these are the most uh, mostly encountered uh, things previously but now it is at control uh, mostly people they hack uh, trees uh, not for commercial purpose but to encroach inside the forest and uh, increase their uh, property next piracy this is the uh, control burning uh, method by which you can uh, avoid the fire uh, fire from passing throughout the forest area inside uh, the forest area we uh, do the uh, fire tracing in a small small patches making that uh, thing a small quadrant like so that the fire should not pass from one area to another area next this is a uh, fire tracing along the road next uh, weed er er eradication we usually have uh, only one weed eupetorium or chromolina odorata uh, the weed eradication is done in phased manner we can't eradicate entire thing uh, in a day because it forms cover for uh, much of the wildlife so we are removing it in patches and uh, burying it so so that it can be controlled next Uh, this is the remote uh, removal of exotics uh, which i observed in uh, kodai canal 
the acacia means is a bigger big tree they fell that tree and let the ground uh, let the succession go on uh, with the local variety next next this is a wash tower for petroling and uh, this is the uh, petroling machan at milgar tiger reserve next boundary clearance uh, there, there is a saying or uh, thing which means that good good fences make good neighbors but we can't fence entire area uh, because uh, wildlife has to move and also the resources has to move so we have a boundary line which which we clear and you can see a keran which is painted next view line clearance uh, this is done along the roads uh, around 6 uh, meter on each side uh, this this allows the driver to see the uh, wildlife coming from other side and also wildlife get alert when the uh, it sees vehicle next but actually uh, that uh, view line clearance is done with fire uh with fire testing uh which sometimes uh, increases the weed growth inside that area so it is to be uh, managed properly next these are the signages like deer crossing no plastic zone uh, whatever uh, when in the wild life sanctuary the speed limit inside the wild life sanctuary next human wildlife conflict this is an issue which is uh, commonly seen uh, in wildlife when wildlife uh, wildlife and humans they they are struggle uh, for resources so we are trying to uh, mitigate it by uh, separating the needs we can't separate the needs of the wildlife so we are uh, trying to change the hab uh, habits and uh, is also is to the human beings next these are the some some of the news of uh, human wildlife conflict next the action in mitigation of uh, human wildlife conflict like we have a crop compensation scheme uh, goa government is having a separate crop compensation scheme Uh, we are uh, uh, growing fodder plots and water availability inside the uh, sanctuaries uh, proactive measures like we have uh, our informants inside the sanctuary which uh, uh, inside the villages which inform con uh, continuously about uh, wildlife straying in uh, outside the uh, borders of pa uh, adoption of early warning systems creation of bar uh, barriers like Uh, solar fencing dedicated uh, control rooms next identification of hotspots like implementation of uh, formulation of uh, improved stall fed uh, farm animals like that uh, providing quick relief uh, we have a uh, uh, we have a scheme in which Uh, we give uh, compensation within 15 days of uh, to the animals which is uh, killed and also uh, if a uh, person is injured or dead next this is animal rescue next this, uh, this is a leopard rescue where a small cage is put inside the well for uh, taking out leopard next and these are the rescue cages uh, in nitravai wildlife sanctuary uh, there are three, three type of cages the extreme right side cage is a smaller cage uh, for uh, rescuing animals from well or a con uh, constrained places the next one is a uh, bigger trap uh, it is having another part of uh, an, uh, a smaller part where uh, a bait is kept and this is uh, this is having the system of uh, with the cable 
that the uh, door of this uh, step suddenly falls when it steps on the pedal inside uh, the extreme left side is a squeeze key this is used for treatment of wild animals next this is a, a animal translocation technique which was observed in uh, kanha national park actually uh, when when we try to uh, tranquilize the uh, animals or we try to uh, trap them uh, mostly herbivores they go for, uh, go into capture myopathy and they die so this is a uh, technique where a funnel shape uh, structure is made to a grass plot where animal are driven slowly slowly inside and uh, when when they go inside uh, one one door is closed and finally they end, end up in a uh, smaller uh, area or a, uh, directly into vehicle which can transfer them to uh, desired location animal health uh, actually the cattle immunization of cattle is in uh, under section 33 of wild life protection act but usually uh, our animal uh, veterinary uh, department is doing uh, immunization of cattle inside uh, uh, in the villages so we just take the record that they have done or not restriction to cattle uh, in the protected area like we do uh, thanking uh, the uh, around the sanctuary this is an animal treatment uh, this is a captured uh, leopard next entry point and awareness activity uh, here we we do something good for the people so people they respond back here we have uh, given some books and school articles to uh, children uh in in collaboration with uh, rotary club uh, this is this was done in wellna village next uh we have uh, given solar cooker solar lamp uh, electric cooker induction cooker so that we can reduce the uh, pressure on the uh, forest uh, also uh, we promote smokeless chula we are giving uh, we have a, a policy to uh, with the animal husbandry that uh, most of the cattle inside this one should be hybrid uh, hybridized with uh, uh, insemination so that they can stall feed them uh, purchase of uh, uh, we mostly uh, require uh, farm yard manure from the uh, for the nurseries we can purchase it uh, from uh, our stakeholders which are inside the wildlife sanctuary next public outreach uh, during uh, one month so and uh, wildlife week next awareness next extension activities uh, we have plan, uh, we have plans to start a uh, apiculture unit in uh, netravi wildlife sanctuary and kodigaon wildlife sanctuary uh, we are al already training them some of the self help groups for uh, uh, apiculture next training for staff next uh this is a uh, training on a uh, first aid uh, which is very necessary for staff because they uh, move inside the forest next right? nature camp for school children next now uh, we are coming for uh, management planning actually uh, management planning is like when can you plan for a wildlife sanctuary uh it is not the plan which which, which is important but it is the process which you, which you follow for that plan once you plan you you give a prescription then the prescription are to be come in practice then the practice should be uh, whatever implementation is done uh should be con uh, constantly monitored and then uh, whatever uh, outcomes come we should learn and adapt next 
assess the state of resources is the first uh, step in management planning then trend in uh, resource uh, whatever means like uh, previous years we have trend like what what was the rainfall in that area what was the uh, wind velocity and all the things like that that uh, resource management objectives then problem what are the problem we are facing and how we are going to them like that. Next, this is a resource mapping. Uh, you can uh, find the area uh, like uh, these having contours which, which show uh, heights of different area, water bodies, uh, where are the grass plot, what, uh, what is the land use pattern inside your uh, area, what are the types of forest. Next, ecotourism. Now, how ecotourism is affecting the management is uh, if if you don't if people don't know what is there and what is its value people won't uh, support uh, for conservation so we have to allow people to come inside but we also have to control them not to explore too much next these are the waterfalls inside the uh, wildlife centuries. Next. Use of technologies. Like we are using uh, One Agni 1.0 for uh, fire monitoring. We are using mobile uh, patrolling and ecological app, uh, M stripes. We are using camera traps, uh, wireless communication. Next. Uh, we don't have uh, in Goa. We don't use radio color and all, but uh, it is a technique for animal tracking. Next. Now we are going to uh, forest legislation. Uh, we have uh, four forest policies. Means we have three effective policies. One is in draft. Uh, it is forest policy 2018. Next. Uh, in forest policy in uh, 1894, uh, the forest was classified into four categories like uh, protective forest for essential climate change, uh, climate and physical grounds, productive forest for supply of uh, timber and fodder, uh, minor forest for timber, timber wood, fodder, grazing, etc., and pasture for, uh, uh, for grazing, which is managed by forest department. Next. The drawbacks were, uh, of 1894 was like uh, they have mentioned the area, but not the extent and the uh, location of the area. The agriculture was given much more uh, prominence than the forest. Uh, more, more than 40% of the area was with the uh, zamindar at that time. Uh, so people, they don't have them. Forestry was uh, transfer subject and every uh, every particular province was having their forest tax. They are they have had a different trees, scheduled trees. They have different different. Many reserve forests were uh, handed over to revenue uh, department, and uh, they were managed by panchayat. And when it, they were degrading, they were given to forest department for rehabilitation. Next, national policy 1952 was uh, the policy first policy of independent India. Uh, it was after two world wars, so the uh, and since the uh, uh, India was a colony of uh, British, they have uh, exploited our forest like anything, and entire system was unbalanced. Next, in 1988 was the uh, uh, policy after uh, many of the. Uh, Environmental, uh, what is called uh, world environment issues. Uh, they have to meet the energy demand. They have to uh, principles and duties of the Indian Constitution uh, for stress on environment. Uh, then growth of forest based industries uh, were more in this this era. Next, the geographical area. Uh, uh, this was described in this uh, policy was one third uh, in flat areas and two third in hilly area. 
of forestry uh, like social forestry farm forestry programs were encouraged too much uh, right and concession uh, of local people was suitably ad addressed in this uh, which led to uh, this ro ro fr act 2006 next the fire and grazing management was given given special consideration uh, the forest based industries uh, were advised to uh, meet their needs from outside the forest next uh, the draft policy has all the things like sustainable uh, management uh, this one like management of ngfp promotion of agroforestry farm forestry etc next uh, these are the novel trust in the uh, forest area. Uh, uh, this forest policy uh, is for forest uh, production, forestry, economic evaluation of uh, forest, forest management for water recycling, forest classification, uh, integrated climate change in concern, red plus strategies, etc. Next. This is the history of forest legislation. Uh, these are uh, various forest laws and uh, which were uh, amended and enacted. Next. The Indian Forest Act uh, was basically a national act. Uh, it was, it is having 13 chapters and 86 sections, uh, which uh, 3 to 20 is constitution of uh, uh, reserve forest. Uh, then next. Uh, it is having uh, uh, sections for protected protected forest uh, penalties and uh, procedures from 52 to 69. Uh, cattle trespass from uh, uh, cattle trespass Act 1971 was given some fatigue inside this act. Uh, forest officers are government uh, servant and all uh, public servant. Uh, actions on forest uh, forest officers were mentioned in 72 to 75. Next. Uh, Wildlife Protection Act. Uh, this was uh, uh, started in, uh, this was enacted in 1972. Uh, it is having 66 sections, uh, 7 chapters and 6 schedules. Uh, the section 1 and 2 is action and uh, title. Uh, 3 to 8 is various authorities like State Wildlife Board, National Wildlife Board, Director of uh, Wildlife Preservation, uh, all in their powers are mentioned in 3 to 8 chapters, uh, sections. Next. Uh, the hunting of wild animals is covered in 9 to 17. Uh, 9 is uh, hunting, uh, prohibition of hunting. 11 is for uh, uh, Hunting of wild animals uh, which are dangerous to human uh, life or property. Uh, 12 is uh, for scientific purpose collection and uh, collection of uh, specimens. Uh, chapter 17 deals with uh, uh, all the uh, trees. Then uh, chapter 4a uh, was central zoo authority uh, recognition and uh, uh, chapter 4B is National uh, Tiger Conservation. Chapter 5 deals with trade and commerce of wild animals and permissions. Next. Forest Conservation Act. Uh, this act was enacted in uh, after 1976 uh, uh, when the uh, forestry was uh, transferred from concurrent list. Uh, presently it was in state. Uh, Uncontrolled conversion was seen. Uncontrolled conversion was uh, seen in uh, the uh, forest uh, areas. Next, scheduled tribes and recognition of uh, uh, act uh, was uh, tribals were initially having uh, much more uh, this one uh, rights over the forest. But in uh, British prevent, uh, prevented them uh, by uh, because they have to use that uh, for railways and defense. Then after uh, the tribal uh, after freedom, uh, the government has uh, invaded them in name of conversion, uh, conservation of the forest. 
Next. Next. Careers and prospects in uh, forestry. Next. Uh, we have range forest officer, which is a bachelor of science or or engineering. Uh, the exam is conducted by department. Uh, the assistant conservator of forest, bachelor of science plus engineering. Uh, the exam is conducted by Goa Public Service Commission. Uh, veterinary officer for zoo. Uh, it is uh, it is not it is masters in veterinary science. Uh, uh, it is selected to Goa Public Service Commission. Uh, deputy conservator of forest, bachelor uh, degree. Uh, it is uh, selected through Union Public Service Commission and biologist, especially in zoo, which is MSc, PhD in animal behavior with experience in working in zoo. Next. This is the same. Uh, the rainforest officer has the uh, uh, walking test for 24 kilometers in four hours and he should be physically fit. Uh, he should answer uh, written test. Uh, which is in three subjects uh, for written test and uh, in oral interview. Then he has to undergo 18 months training in any forest academies. There are seven forest academies uh, throughout the nation. Next. I sit on the of forest. Uh, the posts are advertised by Goa Public Service Commission. The forms are available uh, on website. Uh, the, the selection starts with computer-based recruitment test. Uh, which is conducted by GPSC. Uh, then written test is conducted. Uh, then again, walking test is conducted for 24 hours in four hours, 24 kilometers in four hours. Uh, interview is conducted and selected can candidate has to go undergo training in Caspos Academy. There are two Caspos Academy. One is Dehradun and one at uh, Coimbatore. Next. Uh, Deputy Conservator of Forest is recruitment through uh, UPSC. Uh, there are three levels, prelims, mains, in, uh, and interview. The prelims is common for uh, the services. Prelims is in two parts, general uh, studies, 200 marks, and CSAT for 200 marks. The mains have uh, six papers, four optional uh, papers of subject, uh, of two optional subjects, with uh, English and general uh, general knowledge paper. Then the candidate is called for interview. Uh, after selection, 17 months training plus six month uh, uh, probationer and four years he has to serve as ACF if the states want or uh, they are directly posted at DCF. Next. Uh, this is all what I have to say. Uh, Thank you so much, sir. Sir, there is one question from Stephen Fernandez. He is asking, is it justified to declare wild boar in Goa as vermin? Is there any steps forest department is taking to reduce wild boar human conflict? Actually, uh, declaring a vermin needs a, uh, needs a th thorough study. We have to know it's what, which animal is... Uh, which animal you have to cull or which animal uh, you should declare before declaring vermin, what uh, role it is having. Mostly all wild boars have, uh, they, are, they are like scavengers in the, uh, in the forest. If they don't uh, exist there, there will be a lot of uh, a degradation of, uh, occurring inside the forest. So, as if now we have to do a study, how many of them are raiding crops? Actually, what are, what is the extent of the crop? And what is the value value they are destructing? We can't uh, we can't say that uh, entire uh, uh, wild boars to be culled. We have to specify the numbers. We have to uh, look at the animals which are uh, which are not uh, which are not residing inside the forest and destroying the crops. Also, the uh, value of the crops are very important. Or we can mitigate them with the uh, compensation. Next. So, there is another question from Pradnyan. He is asking to choose a wildlife as a career. What are the various ways or exams or academics to be pursued by students 
and from where we can get the direct guidance on various stages of academics from the schooling days actually uh, uh, what is your goal is very important uh, when you aim for upsc union public service commission you have to start it from 12 when when you are whenever you are in 12th standard you have to study that uh, mostly our student they refer guides to write the exam and score the percentage but actually i will suggest that uh, they should go, uh, stick to their books ncert books or uh, uh, bsc books they have to read the entire thing uh, by filtering the knowledge you can get this scores but when you go for competitive exam they are very much uh, uh, broad uh, broad knowledge is required so and uh, uh, the coaching is available uh, in various coaching centers uh, they are in bombay pune hyderabad in goa i don't think any coaching center is there but books are available for uh, just gist of that uh, knowledge but mostly you have to have some good subjective knowledge thank you so much sir thank you sir there is another question from dr borkar sir what is the reason we still do not have a goa cadre of ifs after so many years of statehood actually it must be uh, the uh, approach of the student uh, mostly all parents they don't think uh, to uh, to send a uh, a child for a uh, services like this mostly all have aims like uh, to become first is doctor second is engineer or first is engineering second is doctor like they they aim towards that and they move they move in that direction only so uh, our our student they don't get uh, uh, guidance to that area that there are civil services you can do more, much better than a doctor and engineer if you are a engineer and if you are a doctor you can still be a civil servant and uh, have you can decide the decide the policies and all the things any more questions the session is open for question and answer okay we shall move forward now uh, sir salilkar i thank you and express my deep gratitude for enlightening us about the wildlife management legislation and career prospect thank you so much sir for your valuable words i now request dr trupti to propose a vote of thanks thank you sweetan good afternoon to the most valued resource persons respected principal professor brinda borkar ma'am our head of the department of zoology mrs suchna amonkar my colleague and all the participants it is an honor to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion on behalf of the department of zoology the city is dhampi college of arts and science i am pleased to inform you that we received an overwhelming response for this webinar with over 400 registrations from 23 states one union territory and four countries the participants who participated are faculty members researchers students government officials forest department officials freelancers ngos and wildlife enthusiasts i thank the resource person of today's webinar dr agt johnson sir dr varit giri dr subal lakshmi and shri damodar salilkar for not only sparing their time from their busy schedule and sharing their crucial work 
but also for making us aware of the array of research and career opportunities that is available in the field of wildlife biology. Thank you for inspiring and encouraging us. I also thank the management and principal of the city's Dhempi College of Arts and Science for the constant encouragement and support. I extend my gratitude to our HOD, Mrs. Sushna Amonkar Ma'am, for her support and guidance. Special thanks to the organizing team committee members, Dr. Teresa, Ms. Mitali Halankar, and Ms. Swizal Quadros for their constant suggestions and support. I also thank Mr. Gaurang Bane for his technical support. Last but not the least, I thank all the participants for their overwhelming response and attendance and for making this webinar a success. Once again, I thank you all for your cordial cooperation. The feedback link will be emailed to you to your registered email IDs just after the end of the webinar. Thank you very much. So with this, we are concluding with the session for today. Thank you all for being, pre for being gracing us with your presence.